No one expects the Spanish Inquisition or me to start right at 3 o'clock. Nevertheless, sometimes those things happen. Fear and surprise and a ruthless efficiency. Those are our chief weapons. Hello, friends. Today is a great chapter reread, The Forsaken. This is going to be a great example of why we do the chapter read-throughs, what the whole point is. Um, it's, it's a good example of how George weaves symbolic ideas through the chapter. So the whole point of this, it's kind of like one of those pictures where it's got a bunch of squiggly lines and you cross your eyes and the image pops out. Except for the squiggly lines are the plot. And they're not just squiggly lines, it's a coherent picture. But if you cross your eyes, there's a different picture that pops out. And so what, what we're dealing with here, and yeah, I, the audio is crisp. The, um, the microphone foam is crisply bird chewed. Sorry about that. I, it's been months, so I should really order a new one. So the whole point of these, of looking for symbolism in the chapters, it's not like, I think that some people don't appreciate exactly how big the scope of what we're doing is. What we're kind of doing is blurring our eyes as we read the chapter to the main plot. And we're just letting Martin present a series of concepts, which he does through a variety of ways. The concepts can come at us through the things that people say, the things that people think, the objects in the room, flashbacks. All this stuff combines to create one narrative of symbolic concepts. And it dances in and out of the story, the plot. Like I said, it's involving the scenery, the words, anything at all. But the point is it all combines to create a cohesive narrative. So what we're going to be doing uh, the next few chapter read-throughs is going through all the chapters that are in the Winterfell crypts. Crypts. It's nearly as bad as isthmus. Crypts. In any case, um, you know, the last read-through we did was the... Bran's last chapter in Blood Raven's Cave, right? And I pointed out that I think there's a lot of parallels between Blood Raven's Cave, especially those singers on the thrones, and the Winterfell crypts with all the kings of winter on the thrones and this mystery about what's in the lower levels and what's going to happen. And so in the Stark Iceberg, we started to really drill down into some more specific ideas about what could be down there and what could be going on with the ancient Starks Kings of Winter, The Night's Watch, and the others. And so by going through all of the crypts chapters, I believe we can potentially push these ideas forward a little bit. Um, so we did the Blood Raven's Cave one, and we're in... Uh, that was actually two chapters ago, or maybe that was the last chapter. Two chapters ago, we did the Theon, Prince of Winter... I don't know. Those were the last two. I don't know what order they were in, but... This is the next chapter after the Prince of Winterfell. So this is the Barbary Dustin monologue chapter. That's why she's on the, on the cover. And, of course, to bring the voices to life with his theatrical skill is my good friend, Greyways Tim. Say hello. Hello. Hello, Greyways Tim. <laughs> yeah, it's a gang, the Winterfell Crips. <laughs> it's, instead of West Side, it's like South Side. It's very South, you know, like under the... <laughs> Or, no, this is uh, this is you bringing me back to my roots. My first ever live stream before I even started doing stuff on my own channel was you bringing me on to discuss Crips of Winterfell. So I come all this way just for you to bring me back into the crypt. Well, that's the thing is that like it's one of the best mysteries in the story because there is so many ways it could go. There's so many literary illusions that are floating around that could lead us to think one or the other thing is going to happen. Eldrick Stoneskin is is trying very hard to get the statues to stand up. We'll see if he can do it. Shout out to Eldrick Stoneskin. Something's coming out of those crypts, you know. Uh, certainly the symbolism is flying out of there. So we're going to try to figure it out. Um, and I do feel like it's a good thing to go over because it's in, it's we don't we probably don't have enough information to solve it. It's like there are some things that we've pinned down, like the others may or may not steal John's body. It either will or won't happen. Um, and you know, it's like we've, we've, there's a lot of theories that have been pushed pretty far, but this is still a big mystery. And there's multiple you know, phases to it. Like George is giving us commentary on the others and the original Starks. 
but he's also foreshadowing stuff about John. Um, there's ideas about John and Leanna, like the more uh, emotional character-based revelations that could be coming, items that could be in the crypts that could have personal meaning to John, but then we're also wondering the oldest kings of winter, what were they doing? Are they on weirwood thrones? Do they, are they going to come to life? Do they have other spirits still roaming? What's up with the swords? So, mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're going to see if we can. All that chapter. So, yes, we are. It, that's to, to your point. It's something we want to circle back on every couple of years and uh, with <laughs> updated ideas and take a look again at these statues and, and, and see what they're telling us. They're feeding them Night's Watch deserters for dessert. Yeah, I saw your comment, Jenny of Old Stones. She she posited that um, the sacrifice that Bran sees in front of the Weirwood Tree, the captive man, maybe he was a Night's Watch deserter, similar to Ned executing Garrod at the beginning of the story. I think that's a pretty good idea that I hadn't really heard before. Um, and that maybe that's even part of the pact, going with my idea that like the pact is at the time of the long night, and it's part of what establishes the Night's Watch. Perhaps that's part of the Stark Steel, is like executing the Night's Watch deserters. That's that's their official duty. It does seem like they are jailers, kind of. So, I dig it. Yeah. And then, yes, Chet, Damon is here. He's becoming ever more of a show stealer these past couple of weeks. <laughs> Well, what's fun is he usually wear black shirts, and he's black, so mm -hmm. it's really just eyes and the silhouette of a flicking tail. It's it's a pretty fun illusion. Yeah, it's that that white tail tip, that little white flame he's got that stands <laughs> out. He's got the happy eyes right now. He loves being in your lap. <laughs> Void Kitty, yes, exactly, Void Kitty, love it. So yeah, so it is the turn cloak. Um, the 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 Barbie Dustin bit at the end of the chapter obviously is kind of the highlight, but there's some great stuff before that, and the artwork on the title image. It's uh, let me give you both artists real quick. It's uh, apologized by Fralichen or Fralichen, and then Barbie Dustin by Iluas Ilaus. So I particularly love the Lady Dustin portrait. It's so like noir, you know. It's, yeah. it's great. It captures the personality. <laughs> and then, uh, as picture? always, please make sure you're subscribed to Grey Waste Tim's channel if you're not already. I assume you're subscribed to my channel. If you're watching the stream, go ahead and click like. Assume it's going to be good and that you will like it. Give me that benefit of the doubt. And <laughs> finally, if you want to... Support the program. You can do that with a super chat through the YouTube system, or you can do a PayPal. And by the way, I got a very generous PayPal yesterday that I do want to thank um, Stephen. Just crushing through my content, sent me a big thank you, and I would like to send a thank you right back to you, Stephen. That's much appreciated. So with that said... Let us get started. Mm -hmm. The first Hello. flakes came drifting down as the sun was setting in the west. By nightfall, snow was coming down so heavily that the moon rose behind a white curtain unseen. Already this reminds us of the Blood Raven, the brand chapter that we just read. The first chapter was about the red sun uh, rising, setting, and rising again. And there's the snow, and the moon is like a sickle. So it's like basically the same tableau opening here with the sun setting nightfall coming down and the moon rising behind a white curtain uh, we saw the moon behind the veil uh, in the wedding in the godswood as well with like an eye peering through a veil so it could be like the veil of tears brand watching from behind you know the veil of tears meaning he's on the on the death side or even uh with the the bridal maidens being analogized, analogized to the moon, with the moon wearing a bridal veil, just like Jane Poole down in the Godswood with a veil. So yeah, the the Brand and Theon chapters are very copacetic. They they weave into one another very nicely with the imagery and the themes that they're talking about, and that's why it's really good to go 
and kind of like jump back and forth between Theon to Bran, back to Bran, back to Theon, that type of deal because of the imagery they're presenting us and how well they mesh. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it's um, it, it's it's a good example of George's parallel storytelling because both Theon and Bran's stories are tied to Winterfell. Many of their chapters takes place at Winterfell. And of course, Theon and Bran have this early interaction where Theon's move to retake Winterfell is what sends Bran out of Winterfell on his plot journey. Um, and then Bran ends up in the cave, which is parallel to Winterfell. So there's just a lot of, yeah, like you said, a lot of common themes and ideas that are being developed through those chapters. And this is something that always comes to light when you compare chapters that happen at the same place. Like, mm -hmm. for example, in the Signs and Portents or Signs and Portals series, I was comparing all the scenes in the Eerie. Some of them are in book one with Catelyn. Some of them are in book four with Peter and Sansa. Uh, but it's still, you see all the same language and, and themes happening. So, yeah. Cool opening to this chapter. Just, again, just like the Brands, uh, A Dance with Dragons 3 chapter. So, the gods of the north have unleashed their wrath on Lord Stannis. Roose Bolton announced, come morning, as men gathered in Winterfell's great hall to break their fast. He is a stranger here, and the old gods will not suffer him to live. His men roared their approval, banging their fists on the long plank tables. Winterfell might be ruined, but its granite walls would still keep the worst of the wind and weather at bay. Oh, let me move the little monitor thing. There you go. They were well stocked with food and drink. They had fires to warm them when off duty, a place to dry their clothes, Washer women to murder them. Oh, wait. Oh, I interjected that. That's not in there. Snug corners to lie down and sleep. Lord Bolton had laid by enough wood to keep the fires fed for half a year. So the great hall was always warm and cozy. Stannis had none of that. Theon Greyjoy did not join the uproar. Neither did the men of House Frey. He did not fail to note. They are strangers here as well, he thought watching Sir Aenys Frey and his half-brother Sir Hostine. Born and bred in the Riverlands, the Freys had never seen a snow like this. The North has already claimed three of their blood, Theon thought, recalling the men that Ramsay had searched for fruitlessly, lost between White Harbor and Barrowton. Oh, they're, they're there. They're in the pies. <laughs> <laughs> fruitlessly. Maybe that's a food joke there. <laughs> Kind of like when Jojen scrambles up the weirwood tree, you know, and then ends up scrambled up in a weirwood bowl. That's the joke. Anyways, uh, go ahead and pick it up. You were doing Theon's voice too, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I had Theon, you had Roos. Yeah. And of course, you're doing Babs when we get to all that. Very good. On the dais, Lord Wyman Manderley sat between a pair of his White Harbor knights, spooning porridge into his fat face. He did not seem to be enjoying it near as much as he had the pork pies at the wedding. Elsewhere, one-armed Harwood Stout talked quietly with the cadaverous horsebane umber. Theon queued up with the other men for porridge, ladled into wooden bowls with a row of copper kettles. The lords and knights had milk and honey and even a bit of butter to sweeten their portions, he saw, but none of that would be offered him. His reign as Prince of Winterfell had been a brief one. He had played his part in the mummer's show, giving the Thane Arya to be wed, and now he was of no further use to Roos Bolton. Halt. Halt, Sir Tim. Okay, so, keeping up with the idea that we're looking for the symbolic ideas that are being presented and sort of blurring our eyes to the plot, and also thinking about the sequence of ideas in Bran's chapter. We're opening with the snow and the moon and the sun setting. Okay, and the moon's behind a veil of some kind. Then, what's happening? We've got a call back to the pies. So the pies, mm -hmm. we should be thinking about Jojen paste because it's very similar. The Jojen paste, look, it's either Jojen's blood or his flesh or his brains. There is some amount of Jojen in the weirwood paste, I promise you. It's most likely his brains, I, I think. Yeah. I really think because it's the... Go ahead. 
I was just saying, because if it's just blood from Jojen, they don't need to necessarily kill them for kill him for that. They and that's one of the theories is that they're bleeding him or something and he's not quite dead. But now, given all of the whisper and the darkness stuff that was happening in that chapter and how we related that back to Lovecraft, which is a story about removing brains and putting them into canisters, Jojen's brain seems like the more likely thing. And there's all that stuff about them eating soup, frog soup out of the helmet. And it's yeah. like, it's the brains that that really is the soup. Anyway, so we've got a call out to the pies, which is similar. It's people in a, it's in it of a bowl. It's in a pie shell. So it's a similar shape. It's round, um, you know. Uh, so then, then after that, everyone's lining up to eat the porridge. And let me, um, let's see, they're well stocked, blah, 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 blah. He's talking about the phrase. They're talking about, and they even give you, just to go back to the main plot, George is giving you more Frey pie clues. He's like, oh, those three, the people that came up missing. And then the next paragraph, oh, but Wyman didn't enjoy the, the porridge as much as those pie, those three pies, the pork pies. <laughs> so George is still trying to feed those, feed the clues to the reader here. But yes, if we're looking at the parallel to Brand's chapter, we've got the similar opening, and now we're doing the cannibalism. So we're we're eating the porridge now. And notice the porridge, it's like, oh, the lords and knights had milk and honey and butter to sweeten their porridge. Remember Brand's weird paste. Pretty sure milk and honey are two of the flavors that it's compared to. I'm almost positive they are. Um, so I don't know about butter, but the milk and honey definitely are. So it's strong... Very strong, weird paste parallels. Now they're talking about this wedding. Bran wed the trees. That was the wedding that happened there. So I guess that would be parallel in some sense. That's hard to understand exactly. But at the very least, uh, Roos and fake Arya's wedding was in front of the weird tree. And Bran is wedding the weird tree. So with that said... Uh, where did you stop? No further use to Roose Bolton. Okay, I'll be this yep. um, couple of soldiers, I guess. Yeah. First winter, I remember the snows came over my head, said a Hornwood man in the queue ahead of him. Aye, but you were only three foot tall at the time, a rider from the rills replied. And then go ahead and keep going. Last night, unable to sleep, Theon had found himself brooding on escape, of slipping away unseen whilst Ramsay and his lord father had their attention elsewhere. Every gate was closed and barred and heavily guarded. No one was allowed to enter or depart the castle without Lord Bolton's leave. Even if he found some secret way out, Theon would not have trusted it. He had not forgotten Kyra and her keys. And if he did get out, where would he go? All right, so quick note, Kyra is one of the women that Ramsay kills and then names a new puppy after. Uh, if he did get out, where would he go? His father was dead and his uncles had no use for him. Pike was lost to him. The nearest thing to a home that remained to him was here, amongst the bones of Winterfell. A ruined man, a ruined castle. This is my place. So hold on a second here. Um... Cookie Chris is asking, could Bran's marriage to the trees be consummated by the shared sacrifice of a green dreamer? I mean, that's what we're saying. I don't know if, what you mean by shared sacrifice, but yes, that's the point, is that the Jojen paste is what helps facilitate wetting the trees or something like that. So that process is even more gruesome than we realize. In fact, we should probably try to construct a, a more solid theory out of why that is and how that works. I always just have fun with the Jojen pace, but like, what's the point of it, you know? Yeah. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but because since they're the one that said shared sacrifice, but do you mean as in shared sacrifice, as in Jojen presenting himself as a sacrifice and Bran accepting it by eating? I, would that be the shared? Oh, as in Bran and the tree ate Jojen together. Ah, uh, Okay, I see what you mean. Symbolically, that's certainly the case. Um, so, did, well, but did um, did Jane and Ramsay eat anything together? I don't know if that was part of the ceremony. I don't think so. 
it didn't specifically mention them eating or drinking anything during the ceremony. In fact, Theon was Theon made it a point of saying weddings are quick in the north, like they kind of skip all the spectacle and pageantry of it. So let me let me posit a theory here, a developing theory that we'll we'll test as this chapter unfolds. I believe that the parallel would be intended in so in Blood Raven's cave, we're seeing one green seer wed the trees. I believe what we're going to be shown here in Winterfell is more like multiple people doing the same ritual. So, for example, because we're talking about the Kings of Winter, many statues of people in thrones. Bran is one green seer in a throne, but then there's those other singers that have already done this before. So Bran is just an example of a greater phenomenon, essentially. And I think that is the parallel. So, for example, it says... Let's see, as his bowl was being filled, the others knew it was safe to laugh as well because Ramsay laughed. So the others are here and they're laughing. Remember, their voices are mocking. So that, that tracks. The others in the prologue, they do laugh and mock. And then it says a second later, oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. There was something about the other men waiting in line. I'm trying to find. There's okay, strangers here as well. On the dais, um. Oh yeah, Theon queued up with the other men for porridge. So the other men are laughing, and the other men are queuing up for porridge. So this is something to do with green seers who become the others, right? The idea like Bran sees the fallen dreamers in his vision, mm -hmm. the other dreamers impaled on the ice spires. That the, that's them. That's what we're talking about here. So that's two other references. And like I said, they're, they're laughing and they're eating porridge. So that makes sense. Those are probably not innocuous, but rather intended other double entendres, as, as you will. Yeah, and, and then, among them... Uh, oh, only three foot are. tall at the time. That's interesting. So a Hornwood man is like, oh, I remember when the snows came over my head. And then the rider from the rill says, you were only three foot tall at the time. The children are three feet tall. <laughs> and so the Hornwood man, like that kind of tracks, like the wood person, you know, yeah. the horned lord. So we could even be talking about the green man connection here but yeah that's good so there's children in the cave there's others eating porridge and where do we stop uh, i was just gonna bring out and among the others lining up for porridge are harwood stout one-armed hard wood stout and horsebane umber who looks like a corpse okay so tree people corpses right and remember yeah this could we could be talking about the green zombie resurrection too. That could involve weirwood paste, or be some sort of similar version of. You know, it's yeah. it's going to be a weirwood ritual involving blood magic, right? And we've I mean, seen that. Go ahead. I was to say green zombie is also another giveaway to it being Jojen's brains because brain eating is par for the course for zombies. George would be a classic Romero fan. That's a good point. That's actually a great point. Of course, the weird would, yeah, the green zombies would eat brain paste. <laughs> that does make a lot of sense. Jenny of Old Stones, I wonder, is Bran going to go find his great, 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 great grandpa, uh, you know, sitting on Weirwoods under Winterfell? Like, yeah, basically, I think so. I think so. But they'll be. I believe the oldest ones will be essentially like bones and petrified weirwood roots. So it'll all be kind of stone. But I believe this, there might be some spirit left would be the point. And that would be the whole point of letting yourself turn into a gray king. You know, for Blood Raven to finish the process, petrify, turn into a real statue, is that his spirit would be able to linger long indeed by doing that. So... 
That, I think, is the truth of the Kings of Winter. But we will see. I'm open to different ideas. I'm not, like, fixated on that idea yet by any means. So, yes. A ruined man, a ruined castle. This is my place, Theon thinks. Um, uh, let's see. He was still waiting for his porridge when Ramsay swept into the hall with his bastard's boys shouting for music. Abel rubbed the sleep from his eyes, took up his lute, and launched into The Dornishman's Wife, Mance Raider's famous song, or favorite song, whilst one of his washerwomen beat time on her drum. The singer changed the words, though. Instead of tasting a Dornishman's wife, he sang of tasting a Northman's daughter. Oh, that's cheeky. That's cheeky, Mance. <laughs> Go ahead, pick it up. He could lose his tongue for that. Theon thought as his bowl was being filled. He is only a singer. Lord Ramsay could flay the skin off both his hands and no one would say a word. But Lord Bolton smiled at the lyric and Ramsay laughed aloud. Then others knew it was safe to laugh as well. Yellow Dick found the song so funny that wine snorted out his nose. <laughs> Lady Arya was not there to share the merriment. She had not been seen outside her chamber since her wedding night. Sour Allen had been saying that Ramsay kept his bride naked and chained to a bedpost, but Theon knew that was only talk. There were no chains, at least none that men could see, just a pair of guards outside the bedchamber to keep the girl from wandering, and she is only naked when she bathes. Okay, so hang on a second. Let's we're again going to keep our policy up of of potentially skipping over <laughs> certain parts. Let me see. Um, no, this is not too terrible. I'll read it. That she did most every night, though. Lord Ramsay wanted his wife clean. She has no handmaids, poor thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You do the lines. Oh, I'll yeah, read the yeah. Rest. I did. I did Ramsay. Okay. Oh, where where was that silent killer? Okay. She has no handmaids, poor thing. He had said to Theon. That leaves you, Reek. Should I put you in a dress? He laughed. Perhaps if you beg it of me. Just now, it will suffice for you to her to be her bathmaid. I won't have her smelling like you. So whenever Ramsay had an itch to bed his wife, it fell to Theon to borrow some serving women from Lady Walda or Lady Dustin and fetch hot water from the kitchens. Though Arya never spoke to any of them, they could not fail to see her bruises. It's her own fault. She has not pleased him. Just be Arya, he told the girl once as he helped her into the water. Lord Ramsay does not want to hurt you. He only hurts us when when we forget. He never cut me without cause. Like, oh, yeah, all right. So this, uh, yeah, the mentality that he's in, victim blaming, blaming her, blaming himself for Ramsay's abuses. Yeah, it's very realistic, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Disturbing, but yeah, this is... Part of the point of the psychological torture, of course. So then it says, Theon, she whispered, weeping. Reek. He grabbed her arm and shook her. In here, I'm Reek. You have to remember, Arya. But the girl was no true Stark, only a steward's whelp. Jane. Her name is Jane. She should not look to me for rescue. Theon Greyjoy might have tried to help her once, but Theon had been ironborn. And a braver man than Reek. Reek, Reek, it rhymes with weak. Ramsay had a new plaything to amuse him, one with teats and a cunny. But as soon as Jane's tears would lose their savor and Ramsay would want Ramsay would want his Reek again. He will so this is interesting, Theon directly comparing his relationship to an actual sexual relationship. An abuse so it's like he recognizes that for Ramsay, like, the abuse is sexual. It doesn't really matter who he's dealing it out to. Like, that's what he gets off on. So mm -hmm. that's a perceptive thought by Theon and good writing, of course. Very disturbing. But um, so let's see. Uh, he will flay me inch by inch. When my fingers are gone, he will take my hands. After my toes, my feet. But only when I beg for it. When the pain grows so bad that I plead for him to give me some relief. There would be no hot baths for Reek. He would roll in shit again, forbidden to wash. The clothes he wore would turn to rags, foul and stinking. 
and he would be made to wear them till they rotted. The best he could hope for was to be returned to the kennels with Ramsay's girls for company. Kyra, he remembered. The new bitch he calls Kyra. He took his bowl back to the hall and found a place on an empty bench, yards away from the nearest torch. Day or night, the benches below the salt were never less than half full with men drinking, dicing, talking, or sleeping in their clothes in quiet corners. Their sergeants would kick them awake when it came their turn to shrug back into their cloaks and walk the walls, but no man of them would welcome the company of Theon Turncloak, nor did he have much taste for theirs. So, a couple of ideas now that we've just hit. So first we're talking about flaying, and we're talking about Kyra. So this is getting back to our theory about the original Boltons, flaying the Starks to steal their powers and how that's implied when you name the dog after the woman that Ramsay's killed. Not you, sorry. When Ramsay (laughs) names one of his dogs after a woman he's killed, it's implying a second life type thing, as if that woman had been a a skin changer. A Stark skin changer is the implication. So I don't know what that has to do with the Long Night and the others. Um if that's a parallel sort of thing about stealing bodies or something like that, it's probably a separate idea. But I haven't... It's a new theory, the whole thing about the Boltons stealing skins. And there is that line about the enmity between Starks and Boltons going back to the Long Night. So it is possible that this weird Bolton skinning people to steal their magic thing has something to do with the others. And yes, the Boltons are symbolic others. That's for sure. So I think it's probably just all parallel. But, because the idea is like, what are the, what, what are the others doing with Craster's babies? They're not turning their eyes blue and raising them in White Walker daycare. I think they're killing those babies and using the, the mana to create the ice golem body of the others, or to just to sustain the ones they have. So that would be similar to like Ramsey killing these symbolic Starks to steal their magic, essentially. Um, yeah. Especially if the first sacrifices were children of the forest, like Nissa Nissa, which does seem to be the, the idea. So that's probably the parallel. Um, the whole idea of sa- you know human sacrifice to create the bodies of the others, where you know Ramsey is uh, essentially sacrificing women in order to create more wolves. Right. Mm-hmm. White Walker daycare fan art, please. Yeah, that'd be maybe on Tumblr. <laughs> it should exist. I'm sure it does. It probably does. I'm not the only one who's made the joke, I think. Okay, so let's see. No hot baths. The clothes would rot. Took his the unturned cloak. Okay, the gruel was gray. Go ahead. The gruel was gray and watery, and he pushed it away after his third spoonful and let it congeal in the bowl. At the next table, men were arguing about the storm and wondering aloud how long the snow would fall. Oh, God, gray day. and watery. That's brain matter. Yep. <laughs> oh, mm. and it's yeah left to congeal in the bowl. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Now, now that you know, once once you deduce the brain thing, then all all of the all of the clues just just pop out and become so much more uh, blatant. <laughs> yep. Yep. So. There's not much to say. <laughs> Groan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all day and all night, might be even longer, insisted one big black-bearded archer with a Kerwin axe sewn on his breast. A few of the older men spoke of other snowstorms and insisted this was no more than a light dusting compared to what they'd seen in the winters of their youth. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is Autumn's kiss, as Big Bucket Wall would tell us. Mm. The Riverlanders were aghast. They have no love of snow and cold, these Sothran swords. Men entering the hall huddled by the fires or clapped their hands together over glow, glowing braziers as their cloaks hung dripping from pegs inside the door. And just a minute, there was a line about 
men having to walk the walls too. Um, so we could be definitely, we should be thinking about a place where there's Night's Watchmen and others, potentially the Night Fort is where this original other creation probably happened. I mean, I think the Night Fort is the place. So yeah, we, we, the kit, there's a, probably another, also a reason why George decided to make it the kitchens that's still there where they, there's the well and the weirwood and stuff like there's mm -hmm. eight hearths, you know, the kitchens. And this is where the rat cook cooked people, which is the inspiration for the fray pies. So strong implications of cannibalism at the knife for it, where the others are created. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, so we take that and then we top it with what's going on in Stannis's camp where he is having to execute his own men because they are performing, some of whom are found to be eating from the corpses. Uh, yeah, so it seems likely that these these very harsh winters naturally event inevitably lead to cannibalism. Yum. <laughs> um. Let's see here. Uh, the air was thick and smoky, and a crust had formed atop his porridge when a woman's voice behind him said, Theon Greyjoy. My name is Reek, he almost said. What do you want? She sat down next to him, straddling the bench, and pushed a wild mop of red-brown hair out of her eyes. Why do you eat alone, my lord? Come, rise, join the dance. He went back to his porridge. I don't dance. I shall never dance, star child. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Prince of Winterfell had been a graceful dancer, but Reek with his missing toes would be grotesque. Leave me be. I have no coin. The woman smiled crookedly. Do you take me for a whore? She was one of the singer's washerwomen, the tall skinny one, too lean and leathery to be called pretty though there was a time when Theon would have tumbled her all the same to see how it felt to have those long legs wrapped around him. What, going, what good would coin do me here? What would I buy with it? Some snow? She laughed. You could pay me with a smile. I've never seen you smile, not even during your sister's wedding feast. Lady Arya is not my sister. I do not smile either, he might have told her. Ramsay hated my smile, so he took a hammer to my teeth. I can hardly eat. She never was my sister. A pretty maid, though. Uh, this is Jane Poole. Okay. I was never beautiful like Sansa, but they all said I was pretty. Jane's words seemed to echo in his head. To the beat of the drums, two of Abel's other girls were pounding. Okay, so what's going on here? So... Jane Poole is Night's Queen. We saw that very clearly. Her symbolism, her corpse, like she's frozen, all that stuff. Um, so the her words are echoing to the beat of drums played by Abel's other girls. So that's interesting. We should be the other girls. We should be thinking about children of the forest that are allied with the others, or. Other women like Night's Queen, perhaps. Something like that. And that is... It kind of makes sense. Or it could just be like the other weirwood trees, I guess. But let's see here. Another one had pulled little Walder Frey up onto the table to teach him how to dance. All the men were laughing. Leave me be, said Theon. Am I not to my lord's taste? I could send Myrtle to you if you want. Or Holly. Might be you'd like her better. All the men like Holly. They're not my sisters, neither, but they're sweet. The woman leaned close. Her breath smelled of wine. If you have no smile for me, tell me how you captured Winterfell. Abel will put it into a song, and you will live forever. Ah, that's interesting. So, Theon, who, as we know, is going to be turned into an instrument of the old gods. He's looking like a Grey King himself with his gray flesh and white hair and stuff. Uh, looks like an old man. He could live forever if he's turned into a song. So this is more Green Seer talk, certainly. 
Uh, real quick, thanks to Balanced Beans Bookkeeping for PayPal and Maester of Tin Foil. Well, Eon, well, Theon eats curds and whey. Where's the spider, though? Mr. Tinfoil. Uh, which kingdom <laughs> would you hide in during the long night? Doesn't matter what kingdom. The point is in a weirwood cave with magical wards. That's where you hide. Uh, I was going to say the spider, it's it's either down in King's Landing because it's Varus, or it's an ice spider. And they're if they're actual ice spiders, they're beyond the wall. <laughs> So let's see here. Uh, and you will live forever. As a betrayer, as Theon Turncloak. Why not Theon the Clever? It was a daring feat, the way we heard it. How many men did you have? A hundred? Fifty? Fewer. It was madness. Glorious madness. Stannis has five thousand, they say, but Abel claims ten times as many still could not breach these walls. So how did you get in, my lord? Did you have some secret way? I had ropes, Theon thought. I had grapnels. I had darkness on my side and surprise. The castle was but lightly held, and I took them unawares. But he said none of that. If Abel made a song about him, like as not, Ramsay would prick his eardrums to make certain that he never heard it. <laughs> He's constantly thinking about what Ramsay would do to him and stuff. Um, interesting, so... Theon the Clever, Land the Clever obviously snuck into Casterly Rock and winkled it from the Casterlies. So that's the parallel that she's making. Theon the Clever winkled Winterfell from the Starks. Okay. Um, now, yeah, it, it, and, and then just a, exactly, a gray man living forever, Green Seeress points out. And that's what we're talking about. That's, that's why I'm saying the Gray King is basically a clue about what happens when the Blood Raven process finishes. You turn into a statue and you petrify with the tree. And that's what the Grey King did. And that's what the Ancient Kings of Winter did. And that is why Theon, as his skin turns gray and he resembles the Grey King, his ancestor, he thinks, ah, I'm a Stark at last. So, yeah, you see how the parallel works. Um, all right. So then I do like how the washerwoman is trying to butter up Theon. Obviously they're trying mm -hmm. to figure out this passage so they can escape and give this secret to Stannis. That is what they're trying to get out of Theon. So she's buttering him up and flattering him. But what she wants is this secret. And it says also, that, um, go ahead. Uh, she also gives away their own secret because when they show up, Abel introduces them as sisters, daughters, and my old mother. So they're all, according to their con, they're all supposed to be a family. And yet she tells Theon they're not her sisters. So she's actually giving away that like, hey, you know, that's just a cover story. We're not actually related. That's true. Yeah, I guess she's maybe trying to confide Theon and Ernest Trust a little bit. Um, Queen of Love and Booty says, Stoked to be here. Discovered you through Alt sh uh, Shift X and have since lived on your page as well as Tim's and Quinn's. Very cool. Thank you. Shout out to Alt Shift and Alt Swift, however many identities a man has. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you can trust me, my lord. Abel does. The washerwoman put her hand upon his own. His hands were gloved in wool and leather. Hers were bare, long-fingered, rough, with nails chewed to the quick. You never asked my name. It's Rowan. And of course, Rowan is another name for a mountain ash. So this is an ash tree woman, just like Ash, the child of the forest, and Asha, and Asha, and Osha, and all the other. Shara, and, you know, Shy Maid. It's all mm -hmm. the same idea. So, yeah. Rowan. All the tree people. <laughs> uh, the okay, so Theon wrenched away. This was a ploy. He knew it. Ramsay sent her. She's another of his japes, like Cairo with the keys. A jolly jape, that's all. He wants me to run so he can punish me. So, yeah, so that is the thing uh, for Kyra and the keys. So, Kyra was able to escape with Theon, but then it turns out 
no, that was all a game. Ramsey let her escape so that he could hunt her. And so now that's another psychological burn into, into Theon is he's afraid of escape because he's afraid that any opportunity to present itself is just Ramsey setting up another game. Mute. Symbolically, I think something just clicked in for me. Um, Kyra and the Keys, they keep saying that. And the name Kyra sounds like Key. If somebody wants to look up the meaning of the word Kyra, that would be cool. But it sounds like Key. And of course, Nissa Nissa, the whole point of Azor Rahai killing Nissa Nissa is that he uses her as a door to get into the Weirwood Net. That's why we have all that Weirwood door symbolism and why the Nissa Nissa characters turn into Weirwoods with the stigmata when they die. So Kyra in the Keys, same idea. Ramsey is the Azor High figure. And like I said, the Bolton parallel is that they're killing Stark women, skin changers, and men probably, and stealing their skins to steal their magic. So the, the murder is a doorway in which to steal the magic. That's exactly what I'm stealing about, what I'm saying about Azor High. Him killing Nissa Nissa gives him the keys to the Weirwood Net because Nissa Nissa is a child of the forest woman or green woman or something like that. So, yeah, that's the whole point. Um, Kyra's name is pronounced Kiera. Kira. I mean, yeah, there's, I guess, a few different ways you could pronounce it. Um, Oh, but isn't there uh oh the one of the Empress of uh Empresses of Lang is Kiara. K-I-A-R-A. That's probably the same idea. Yeah, and one of the god emperors of Yi T, uh Lo Longspoon, was famed for cracking open people's skulls and eating their brains with a long spoon. So we get a lot of brain eating imagery from far eastern God King, God Queen figures. Oh, then there's uh, Quave. And she is, so Quave symbolically is like Nissa Nissa's voice coming from inside the Weirwood Net. She's wearing a red lacquered wooden mask. The mm -hmm. Weirwood face is a, is a wooden mask with red blood that's like crusted like Ruby. So Quave is giving you starry wisdom from beyond through a red wooden mask. So that is basically like Nissa Nissa from inside the Weirwood Net speaking to Danny. Which is one reason why I'm open to the idea that some of the Three-Eyed Crow stuff might be Nissa Nissa's spirit. Um, but let's not get lost there. So yeah, all these key names. So Quave is pronounced Keith. No, I'm pretty sure it's Quave. But yeah, <laughs> it, it still works. So... Um, Kiara with a C is a popular Irish language female name. It is the feminine version of the name Ciaran, meaning dark haired. It was also the name of Saint Ciara, a 7th century Irish saint. Uh, that doesn't tell us too much, though. And also, yeah, well, the wordplay of key with a Q, that's where a boat docks, right? So now we're talking about the Green Sea and the Weirwood Net and ships in the harbor, Weirwood Boats on the key yeah so that's just fun wordplay doubling up there kira means beautiful woman or dancing leaf key i r r a okay well that sounds right beautiful woman or dancing leaf like literally the child of the forest they're singers one of them's called leaf mm -hmm. so yeah and them trying to escape through the woods while Ramsey hunts them that yeah dancing leaves those are like all the leaves getting kicked up as they run okay so this is this is really getting tightened up then so you can see what I'm talking about perpetually with Nissa Nissa that she's a door and a key Azor High's murdering her and breaking into the weirwood net like it's implied so many ways and it always comes back to Nissa Nissa being implied as a child of the forest so yeah, a dancing leaf, a beautiful woman that's a dancing leaf that's a key to the weirwood door. That's Nissa Nissa. And that's also why the screaming hinge of, of Aaron's chapters is like Nissa Nissa's scream. The whole screaming sound of Dragon Binder, we're opening a door, like a forbidden door, the hinge is screaming open, 
this is the door to of death. That bad things can come out of that door when you pry it open. Like that's Nissa Nissa's scream. That's why her scream is like the opening of that door because her death is Azor High opening the door and breaking into the Weirwood Net. So, all right. Getting back to the, uh, let's see, Kyra and the Keys. He wanted to hit her. Uh, yeah, go ahead with he wanted to hit her. Uh, to smash Would, although that don't, mocking... Obviously, violence against women is bad. Don't, don't do that. To smash that mocking smile off her face, he wanted to kiss her to her right there on the table and make her cry his name. But he knew he dare not touch her in anger or in lust. Reek, reek. My name is Reek. I must not forget my name. He jerked to his feet and made his way wordlessly to the doors, limping on his maimed feet. So that strongly um, reminds us of, you know, agony and ecstasy. The idea that Azor High loved his wife but murdered her. Um, so they see this weird conflict of love and hate thrown together. And that's just what we see with Theon. And that's what he's feeling towards another one of these symbolic Nissa Nissa key women. So, uh, go ahead. Keep reading. Outside, the snow was falling still. Wet, heavy, silent. It had already begun to cover the footsteps left by the men coming and going from the hall. The drifts came almost to the top of his boots. It will be deeper in the wolf's wood and out on the king's road where the wind is blowing. There will be no escape from it. A battle was being fought in the yard. Riswell's pelting Barrowton boys with snowballs. Above, he could see some squires building snowmen along the battlements. They were arming them with spears and shields, putting iron half helms on their heads and arraying them along the inner wall. Okay, so they're they're building a snowman army. So yeah, an army an army of snow of ice men, snowmen. So very and it's much the squires other. who are doing it. Um, yeah. The squires young are boys. probably children parallels because they are young and they serve the knights in the same way the children serve the green seers. The squires are shorter. And also squire sounds like squirrel and the children are the squirrel people. So that's probably the main thing. So yeah, the squires are building uh, the Riswell's at Pelting Barrowton boys. So... A minute ago, it said, uh, this snow is only a dusting. I was thinking of House Dustin of Barrowton mm. because they're tied to corpses and death and potentially Night's Queen and all that stuff. So the snowstorm is a dustin. And there we see the Riswells, whose symbolism is all about horses. Uh, and they're fighting with the corpse people. So I'm not sure what that's about. But they're... Um, Riswell's pelting Barrowton boys with snowballs. Well, the Barrowton boys would be like the children of the grave, I guess. Pelting them with snowballs. Oh, pelting. A pelt is like a skin. So they're make. it's the same thing as building the snowmen. If they're pelting someone with snowballs, they're giving them a snow pelt. A snow skin. <laughs> you dig? And the Barrowton boys... Yeah. Barrowton people are corpse people. And the children, so these are dead children, meaning dead green seers that are getting snow pelts. And then the next, the very next sentence, the squires are building snowmen. So it's the same, it's just standard George Martin stuff where he's giving you the same idea in different versions. It's sort of showing off his command of symbolism. Be like, how many ways can we build an other in one paragraph? So it says, Wet, heavy, silent, the snow had already begun to cover the footsteps left by the men coming and going. The others do not break the snow. So these men, the thing about them that makes them men, that they break the snow is being covered up. They're turning into others. The drifts almost came to the top of his boots, it will be deeper in the wolf's wood. Um, let's see. And then, of course, wolf's wood, that's getting at the idea of the others as wolves that come from the wood. And the snows are piling up there. But yeah, the main thing is pelting the Barrowton boys with snowballs. Squires building snowmen. They were arming them with spears and shields. 
arraying them along the inner wall, a rank of snowy sentinels. And of course, as we said, sentinel trees are, are a major vehicle that George uses for other creation because they're trees that are named after soldiers. So anytime you have a sentinel tree that gets covered in snow, that's an other. And so, yes, we, a rank of snowy sentinels. You also think of the 79 sentinels who were planted in the ice like trees and then frozen. So, yeah. so also I looked up, so rills mean stream. And you said that line about building and other what things that would be necessary. Well, you got corpse boys and ice. So frozen water corpses and frozen water. And these are the, they're the Lord of the waters. So yeah, building and other. Yeah. And the river stream symbolism is important because that's like the river of time. The wall is like a river. Uh, their voices are like the cracking of ice on the lake. So it's all this cold version of the Green Sea idea. Whenever you see this cold river, cold stream, frozen pond, etc. So yeah. And then it says, Lord Winter has joined us with his levies. One of the sentries outside the Great Hall japed until he saw Theon's face and realized who he was talking to. Then he turned his head and spat. So George is constantly distracting us from the symbolism with the main plot. That's almost how I think about it. Because he's doing, throwing his, like, oh yeah, that's right, Theon's hated. They have to spit when they see him. But yes, it's Lord Winter with his levies. And that's the thing, it's like the Starks are called the King of Winter. So what's the difference between Lord Winter and King of Winter? Or Lord Snow? Like Lord Snow, Lord Winter. King of Winter. These are all the same name. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, I mean, because... When they were kings, in, they were kings of winter until the time of Aegon the Conqueror. Then they, uh, Torrin Stark kneels, but he rises again as a lord. So he is, he is taking like a lesser seat by giving up the title of king in exchange for the lesser title of lord. But the idea is still basically the same. Yep, and and his levies. Um, was just the urge to start singing Led Zeppelin. Um, but yes, <laughs> we've got we've got these uh, snowy sentinels. They're very like the 79 sentinels who are also up on the wall. You know what I mean? So I just remind you again, Night King, Night's King rather, who in my head canon, which is some of yours head canon, he and Night's Queen are the progenitors of the others. And it says that Night's King bound his brothers to him with strange sorceries. That is part of the same idea. So there is some aspect in which he is binding his brothers of the watch that he led to make the others. How does that make sense? Well, the original watch were green men. They were, sa they were sacrificed. They were killed, along with Nissa Nissa. And the others are essentially created with the spirits of those green men. And that is shadow binding because we're binding spirits to new bodies and stuff. That's all shadow binding. So Night's King binding his brothers with strange sorceries, that's also a part of the creation of the others. So here we see basically that idea, like these snowy sentinels, their former trees, their former children, their dead children, their dead green men, all that kind of stuff. And that is why we see, like, the 79 sentinels who symbolize others atop the wall at the night fort. Okay, because, like, the Night's Watch and the others, they have a, they have a shared origin. And so we're going to be talking about both of those things. So, beyond the tents... Go ahead. Beyond the fence, the big destriers of the knights from White Harbor and the twins were shivering in their horse lines. Uh, Ramsay had burned the stables when he sacked Winterfell, so his father had thrown up new ones twice as large as the old to accommodate the war horses and palfreys of his lord's bannermen and knights. The rest of the horses were tethered in the wards. Hooded grooms moved amongst them, covering them with blankets to keep them warm. Theon made his way deeper into the ruined parts of the castle, 
As you pick through the shattered stone that had once been Maester Lewin's turret, ravens look down from the gash in the wall above, muttering to one another. From time to time, one would let out a raucous scream. He stood in the doorway of a bedchamber that had once been his own, ankle deep in snow that had blown in through a shattered window, visited the ruins of Mikan's forge and Lady Catelyn's sept. Beneath the burned tower, he passed Rickard Riswell, nuzzling at the neck of another one of Abel's washerwomen, the plump one with the apple cheeks and pug nose. The girl was barefoot in the snow, bundled up in a fur cloak. He thought she might be naked underneath. When she saw him, she said something to Riswell that made him laugh aloud. Theon, Theon trudged, trudged away from the... I'll go ahead. There was a mm -hmm. stair beyond the mews, seldom used. It was there his feet took him. The steps were steep and treacherous. He climbed carefully and found himself alone on the battlements of the inner wall, well away from the squires and their snowmen. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a difference between the two walls here. It's interesting there's two walls. Remember, Edric Snowbeard built the outer wall of Winterfell, the bigger one, which I take to mean, or is it the... I don't remember which one's bigger. He built the outer wall, though, and I took that to be a clue about a Stark, who is an ice magician, Edric Snowbeard, having built the wall. Um, uh, so here we've got, you know, we're talking about um, the other wall has the snowy sentinels, and here he's near the inner wall. He's away from the squires and their snowmen. It's being called out that he's away from them. So maybe this wall will be more aligned with the Night's Watch or something? Let's see, though. No one had given him freedom of the castle, but no one had denied it to him either. He could go where he would within the walls. Winterfell's inner wall, here we go, was the older and taller of the two. There's your answer. Its ancient gray crenellations rising 100 feet high with square towers at every corner. The outer wall, raised many centuries later, was 20 feet lower, but thicker and in better repair, boasting octagonal towers in place of square ones. Between the two walls was the moat, deep and wide, and frozen. Drifts of snow had begun to creep across its icy surface. Snow was building up along the battlements, too, filling the gaps between the merlins and putting pale, soft caps on every tower top. Beyond the walls, as far as he could see, the world was turning white. The woods, the fields, the king's road. The snows were covering all of them beneath a pale, soft mantle, bearing the remnants of the winter town, hiding the blackened walls Ramsay's men had left behind when they put the houses to the torch. The wounds snow made, snow conceals, but that was wrong. Ramsay was a Bolton now, not a snow, never a snow. Okay, mm. so a couple things here. One, George really is captured by the magic of winter and loves describing snow. That is obvious. Secondly, it's an interesting sort of psychotic narrative going on inside of Theon's head at the end there where he's like, making little jokes to himself. Ah, the wound snow made, snow conceals, but that's wrong because Ramsey's not a snow, he's a Bolton. Like, <laughs> okay, Theon. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the frozen moat, that's more frozen pond stuff. The others come out of the frozen pond. Jane, Jane Poole's symbol is basically a frozen pond. It's in between the two walls. That's interesting. Um, the inner wall is taller and older. We'll have to just keep reading and see what he does with the walls, though. Swinny the Pooh says, as always, love your content. Never pass on Dynamo Tim. I think Helen Mirren would make a great Lady Dustin. That's interesting. Yes, and, oh, uh, yeah, I do I do feel the love. Thank you. I do, I do, I go back and I rewatch these to see how things turned out, and I read the comments, and yeah, I'm very appreciative of everyone who has such kind things to say, and is enjoying my input and the things that I'm contributing. Yep, there's um, hardly any people that complain, and they've all been deleted, so. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to point out, okay, so hiding behind the blackened walls, uh, but the snow is now covering it. Okay, so we have, because George always loves his use of parallels. So, of course, blackened walls makes us think of blackened stone. And then out in the Far East, we have our own wall variant, which is the five forts built of fused black stone. 
and they guard against the demons of the lions of the night. Now that could mean Eastern others if the long night happened on both ends or it could be something else, but still it's the blackened walls are being covered by snow. So it's the idea of something like the wall, not the wall itself, but something that is a direct parallel to the wall being defeated by snow. It's the idea of the others. So it, it, in, in a way it's a, it's an idea of the others uh, getting past the wall because they're getting past here they're covering up something that acts like the wall. I was I was thinking you were going to like this is a clue about black stone existing underneath of the ice wall. That also well that that's another one. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like yeah. if the blackened walls like that's the original black stone wall that we think the great empire of the dawn might have laid down. Yeah, yeah. To begin wall, the construction of the the wall that we have now. Yeah, somewhere buried underneath all that white is the wall's foundation, just like the foundation of the high tower, probably black stone. It's just it's packed under centuries of ice and snow now. I'm I'm yeah, if it was I would take the over if it was fifty fifty on on there being black stone under the ice of the wall. So Interesting. Farther off, the rutted King's Road had vanished, lost amidst the fields and rolling hills, all one vast expanse of white. And still the snow was falling, drifting down in silence from a windless sky. Stannis Baratheon is out there somewhere, freezing. Would Lord Stannis try to take Winterfell by storm? If he does, his cause is doomed. The castle was too strong. Even with the moat frozen over, Winterfell's defenses remained formidable. Theon had captured the castle by stealth, sending his best men to scale the walls and swim the moat under the cover of darkness. The defenders had not even known they were under attack until it was too late. No such subterfuge was possible for Stannis. That's right, Stannis will need a much trickier trick, as we have discussed. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm -hmm. He might prefer to cut the castle off from the outside world and starve out, at, starve out its defenders. That would be... Stannis doing exactly what was done to him when he was holding Storm's End, if he were to do that. Because that's what Mace Tyrell did. Uh, Winterfell storerooms and cellar vaults were empty. A long supply train had come with Bolton and his friends of Frey up through the neck. Lady Dustin had brought food and fodder from Barrowton, And Lord Manderley had arrived well provisioned from White Harbor. But the host was large. With so many mouths to feed, their stores could not last for long. Lord Stannis and his men will be just as hungry, though, and cold and footsore as well, in no condition for a fight, but the storm will make them desperate to get inside the castle. Snow was falling on the godswood, too, melting when it touched the ground. Beneath the white-cloaked trees, the earth had turned to mud. Tendrils of mist hung in the air like ghostly ribbons. Okay, yeah. Every any time we see mist just kind of floating about as some kind of spectator, the idea is others watching. Why did I come here? These are not my gods. This is not my place. The harch tree stood before him, a pale giant with a carved face and leaves like bloody hands. A thin film of ice covered the surface of the pool beneath the weirwood. That's the cold one. Theon sank to his knees beside it. Please, he murmured through his broken teeth. I never meant... Oh, that's you. Sorry. Go ahead. The words caught in his throat. Save me, he finally managed. Give me... What? Strength? Courage? Mercy? Snow fell around him, pale and silent, keeping its own counsel. The only sound was a faint, soft sobbing. Jane, he thought... It is her, sobbing at her bridal bed. Who else could it be? Gods do not weep, or do they? Okay, um, just got to lay this out here. So, because I've got an idea of what George is doing here with Theon and the old, placing him in the old, in the realm of old gods, especially weirwood trees, when he himself is ironborn and his god should be the drowned god. And this is, so so here here's here's like the, the Lovecraft dump, I guess, where we're going. Go um, for it. So, I'm just gonna work on my shoulder here a little bit. I've got some 
some pains going on. Been working on a new video real hard. By the way, the next video, not going to be Ironborn Part 1. I've got a total surprise coming for you next Tuesday or Thursday. Not even going to tell you what it is. Go ahead, Tim. All right. So, uh, so, so, Theon's god, the Drown God, is obvi our obvious Cthulhu parallel. That's pretty cut and dry at this point. Um, and I've talked a lot about the Star Spawn, which are Cthulhu's children, how he has three sons and a daughter that line up perfectly with Bale and Greyjoy having three sons and a daughter. And his youngest son is imprisoned, just as Theon is imprisoned. But there are servants of Cthulhu called the Yugs, and there are these giant carnivorous white worms, and they are continuously trying to chew through the locks that imprison this son of Cthulhu and break him free. So that, and that is like the reason why I did the House of the Worm stream that I did, is building up, and why I'm doing a Zothic legend cycle, is building up to this idea of Theon is a parallel to Zothamog, the youngest son of Cthulhu, whose ability is to invade people's dreams. So mm. Theon, all we, along with Bran, again, them meshing together into these dreamlike parallels that always take place in Weirwoods, and Weirwoods constantly being compared to white worms, white serpents, is is another, it's a, it's a comparison, it's paralleling Theon and Zothamog uh, someone who is in uh, uh, a son of the drowned god, a son of Cthulhu who is imprisoned, but the white worms are trying to bust him out. So here he is in the weir in in this grove of weirwoods, asking the old gods for to save him. Well, mm -hmm. in Lovecraft, that's exactly what they're doing. The white worms are trying to save Zothamog and bust him out. And then what happens? Uh, we never get there. He, uh, he just kind of stays in prison. I mean, when Zothamog is allowed to get out, his he starts invading people's dreams. But mostly it's him trying. To, it, it's all him working towards his own escape. Interesting. Um, so Theon is. Theon is now in this weird position of giving Stannis kind of advice or information but there's mm -hmm. pressure on him. Remember, of course, the Crows and Asha Greyjoy now want Theon to be given to the Heart Tree instead of burned. So there's a chance. I do think Theon's probably going to live, but there's a chance he could be sacrificed and his spirit will somehow yeah. still be able to whisper to people or something like that. And that would be... In yeah. and, and just in the way that the the white worms are constantly trying to bust Zoth out, Theon is continuously moving from prison to prison to prison. He starts off as a ward of Ned Stark. I mean, he's taken care of very well, but he's a hostage. This is a caretaker right. prison. He right. then becomes Ramsay's prisoner. Now he's Stannis's prisoner. He, like for, he's forever moving from one prison to another, just in the way that Zothamog is continuously trapped. And every time he gets a chance to get out, he always ends up sealed again. Like that's well, that's and the even story beyond that, the whole thing where Ramsay is giving him these fake opportunities to escape, but they're never to real. Out. Yeah, just as Zoth gets a few opportunities to let his influence out but it always uh, it always stops he's never fully able to get that great breakout moment something always kind of uh circumvents it and of course we got to watch out for this black pond beneath the weirwood it's turned into an icy pond and setting aside the theories about the ice dragon and stuff which i always love the others come from the frozen pond their voice is the cracking of that pond so it's in front of this frozen pond that Theon is begging for mercy, strength, something. His name back is what he's looking for. And that's what Bran gives him in a subsequent chapter when he whispers the name Theon on the, le on the wind. So um, let's see. The sound was too painful to endure. Theon grabbed a hold of a branch and pulled himself back to his feet knocked the snow off his legs, and limped back towards the lights. 
There are ghosts in Winterfell, he thought, and I am one of them. More snowmen had risen in the yard by the time Theon Greyjoy made his way back. To command the snowy sentinels on the wall, the squires had erected, erected a dozen snowy lords. So, um, yeah, uh, a dozen. So this is an interesting number. Of course, Night's King was a 13th man to lead the watch. And if my theory is right that he killed those, killed his, his fellow green men, like we could be talking about 12 sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And that last hero's dozen, like, that's the same thing. I guess I should be clear about that. Those 12 companions of the last hero that died, those would be the same green men that are sacrificed to make the others. Their bodies become the watchmen after their murder powers the blood sacrifice of the others. It's, that seems to be the picture. Um, so it's interesting here. We've got a dozen snowy commanders. Like these, this really sound like a snowy lords, rather. These sound like the dozen green men that Night's King has killed to make the first others to me. But, I mean, I don't know how else, what else to call that. They're definitely, um, commanders of the snowy, of the snowy sentinels. So what is what is that implying? Like, is there is there two levels? To, uh, there was an old theory that there's there's more hierarchy of others than we have seen. That there's like White Walkers and others, and that those are different or something like that. What? Who are these dozen snowy lords? Because the snowmen are already others. They're snowy sentinels. You know, yeah. they're not whites. They sound like others. So who are these commanders? Hmm. Are these the original kings of winter? Yeah, I'm not sure because, again, until we get more of the others, we don't know how their society works. If there is uh, tears to that, like the way the show went with Night's King and how some others seem to be acting like generals leading armies of whites. We really, we really don't know. It's an unknown unknown at the moment until George gives us more of that. And, but I mean, in the next paragraph, he will talk about like he, he names four that these dozen are supposed to be. Um, yeah, go ahead and read that and we'll break it down. Uh, one was plainly meant to be Lord Manderley. It was the fattest snowman the Theon, the Theon had ever seen. <laughs> the, yeah, hard to believe there's still so much snow when they had to build a, a, a Wyman Manderly snowman. All that snow should have been put to use. Well, that's uh, how much the snow there is. <laughs> He's fat. Uh, the one-armed lord could only be Harwood Stout. The snow lady, Barbary Dustin, and the one closest to the door with the beard made of icicles had to be old Horsebane Umber. So now these four... I can definitely say are f these four lords are ones who are all planning to betray the Boltons at one point. Okay, so why don't we go through that first and then we'll talk about the symbolism. Okay, so, well, we've already, we talked a lot about Lord Manderley and the Frey Pies. It's obvious Lord Manderley is going to betray Roos Bolton. Um, Horsebane Umber, he begrudgingly uh, gives his support to Lord Bolton, to Roos Bolton, but that is only because the his nephew, the Great John, is being held captive by the Freys. Um, Roos Bolton even says as much. It's in that chapter where Roos Bolton is talking with Theon and he tells him about uh, Domeric, and he also reveals to Theon that uh, the Bastards boys, Ramsay Stooges, are actually all informants for him. He says that he suspects Horsebane Umber is going to betray him, and which he is. Uh, Horsebane Umber is waiting for the moment when that can happen, and for him, that is going to be when the safety of the Great John is secured. Now, for that part, his other, his brother, Great John's other uncle, Moore's Umber. He has pledged support to Stannis. And they make it a point to say that the Great John took the majority of the Umber host down with him. So all that is left are the very, very old men and the very, very young men, the green boys and the gray beards. 
Moore's Umber is leading the Green Boys. That's that like that march of them playing the horns, and Horsebane is leading the Gray Beards. So that means Moore's Umber is like our Green King figure. He's a green man leading his army of Green Boys. On the Blowing other horns, side, too. Yeah. On the other side is Horsebane Umber. So he's our Gray King leading the gray beards, but, and they're on opposing sides, but they're both waiting for that moment when Horse Bane can drop the act and come back, and they can come back together and fight on the same side. Again, that that moment is when the safety of the great John is secured. So that's interesting that these are all lords that are going to flip because, yep. okay, so yeah, first of all, shout out to Minty in the chat. Second of all, it's 420, praise Garth. And third of all, I think that's, that is important because we're just talking about who are these lords that are commanding the others. Maybe that's mm -hmm. the Night's Watch, actually. Like, they're the ones that are supposed to command the others. Like, think about John, you know, um, because these are all people that are, like, frozen but are turning against the others. And... and uh, in the chat, uh, uh, Carl Karsnack pointed out, Whore's Bane, we should think of Whore Frost. So Frost mm -hmm. Bane, as in someone who's against winter. He was, he was implied as cadaverous earlier, and now he has a beard made of ice. But a snowbeard mm -hmm. is a Stark name. Edric Snowbeard, he's the one who built the outer wall. He's a very important Stark. So Whore's Bane is a corpse-like person who is implied as a Stark that fights against the cold. So that makes him yeah. like a green zombie watchman. Remember, he I said be... the green men... Hold on one second, Tim. So the green men are yeah. killed. That sacrifice creates the others, but the corpses are raised as the watch. So that's kind of like why these are snowy lords. They are kind of look like others, but they're implied as turning against the others, all four of them. And Manderley's the same thing. We broke down Manderley's symbolism before. He's a green man who's turned into an other, but is planning on turning back to the green man's side, essentially. So, yeah, I was going to say he's a corpse like giant. Cause remember, like I've said numerous times now, the sigils tell a story all their own. The sigil of house Umber is a giant breaking out of chains. And mm -hmm. then I also want to give a shout out again, as always crow's food daughter, because like I said, this is a green King and great King figure and they're brothers, Moors and Horsebane are brothers, and she has that idea that Garth, that Grey King, is good brother to to uh, Garth, Garth the Green. And a uh, bunch of swamp jokes going around. Just want to say shout out to all the swamp witches, mermaids <laughs> in the crowd. Those are my people. So, yes, um, that's okay. So that's really interesting here. Yeah, who commands the others? Like, that's that's what I think John is going to do. Like, is lead the others back into the Weirwood Net somehow. Um, that's what the inverse reading of the prologue implied. So, let's keep reading, though. Oh, uh, and a corpse-like giant? That's a Weirwood. We just, he just described the Weirwood as a pale giant. Mm. You know? And it's like, with giants waking in the earth, that's probably got something to do with weirwoods too as we've discussed yeah. and it's a giant busting out of chains so giants waking from the earth yeah right so okay so inside the cooks were ladling out beef and barley stew thick with carrots and onions served in trenchers hollowed from loaves of yesterday's bread scraps were thrown onto the floor to be gobbled up by ramsey's girls and the other dogs uh the other dogs right because ramsey's dogs are the ones they're like the stolen Stark magic, you know, that's what they represent. So they would parallel the others. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's what you could say. Like the Stark walls are like the watch and Ramsey's dogs are like the others. So the girls were glad to see him. He knew him by his smell. Red Jane loped over to lick at his hand and Hellicent slipped under the table and curled up by his feet, gnawing at a bone. These are all Nissa Nissa names, by the way, Red Jane like, if Jane Poole is a knight's queen, she's Blue Jane. This is Red Jane. And the name Jane means something interesting, too. Uh, 
car snark or someone could you look that up real quick um and then uh what was the other name hellicent that makes you think of hell from norse mythology and i'm not sure what hellicent means but definitely hell is a this and this thing that's like melisandre is a hell parallel Let's see. gray jane hellicent jez allison kyra maud red jane sarah and willow those are the named uh hounds of ramsey say it again more slowly the Bastards Girls. Grey Jane, Hellicent, Jez, Allison, Kyra or Kira, Maud, Red Jane, Sarah and Will Oh, Red and Grey so there's Red Jane and Grey Jane. So there's that's Weirwood again. Mm -hmm. It's not the red and the white, but the red and grey, so it's kinda close enough. And then Hellicent means temple path. So that's, yeah, this and this is a path to the old gods, you know, temple path. That makes sense. That's pretty good, actually. Um, okay, so, and that's, yeah, that's just symbolic, like, yeah, telling you, like, Nissa Nissa and the sacrifice of these children. This, that is, that is what powered the creation of the others, which, again, makes you think of Nissa Nissa and Night's Queen as the same person. Okay, so they were good dogs. It was easy to forget that everyone was named for a girl that Ramsay had hunted and killed. Weary as he was, Theon had appetite enough to eat a little stew, washed down with ale. By then the hall had grown raucous. Two of Roose Bolton's scouts had come straggling back through the hunter's gate to report that Lord Stannis's advance had slowed to a crawl. His knights rode destriers, and the big war horses were foundering in the snow. The small, sure-footed garrons of the hill clans are faring better, the scouts said, but the clansmen dared not press too far ahead, or the whole host would come apart. Lord Ramsay commanded Abel to give them a marching song in honor of Stannis, trudging through the snows, so the bard took up his lute again, whilst one of his washerwomen coaxed a sword from Sour Allen and mimed Stannis slashing at the snowflakes. Go ahead. Theon was staring down at the last dregs of his third tanker when Lady Barbary Dustin swept into the hall and sent two of her sworn swords to bring him to her. When he stood below the dais, she looked him up and down and sniffed. Those are the same clothes you wore for the wedding. Yes, my lady. They are the clothes I was given. That was one of the lessons he had learned at the Dreadfort, to take what he was given and never ask for more. Lady Dustin wore black, as ever, though her sleeves were lined with vair. Her gown had a high, stiff collar that framed her face. You know this castle. Once. Somewhere beneath us are the crypts, where the old Stark kings sit in darkness. My men have not been able to find their way down into them. They have been through all the undercrofts and cellars, even the dungeons, but... The crypts cannot be accessed from the dungeons, my lady. Can you show me the way down? There's nothing down there, but... Dead Starks? Aye, all my favorite Starks are dead, as it happens. Do you know the way or not? I do. He did not like the crypts, had never liked the crypts, but he was no stranger to them. Show me. Sergeant, fetch a lantern. My lady will want a warm cloak, cautioned Theon. We will need to go outside. It's interesting that, um, basically, she's looking for more or less the same thing as the washerwomen are. Because the secret passage out of Winterfell almost certainly goes through the crypts. And Abel was looking for them, too. So... First, we have one of the washerwomen trying to get a secret out of Theon by flattering him, which normally works, but Theon's ego has been destroyed, so that doesn't work for him. And here we see the different approach. Barbie Dustin is just bullying him. She's mm -hmm. just like, do it, show me, take me there. And just because that's what Theon is used to, is being commanded. So we see that the different psychological approach is more effective. Now, she's more powerful, too, but Ramsay, I mean, uh, 
Theon could have just broken down and been like, no, I can't. Ramsay will kill me. Oh. And he doesn't. He like snaps and obeys because that's kind of what he's been programmed and molded to by Ramsay. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Like, like you said, like, uh, he's, yeah, he's been broken down, but she, she notices that. So she's able to figure out like, okay, uh, that, that old, the approach for the old Theon, like how Rowan was trying, isn't going to work anymore. He's been broken down to the level of an infant. Like this is what it's gonna have to do. To sh- you're gonna have he he's gotten so used to being treated like dirt. That's what's gonna get a response out of him, and that's what's gonna get him to do what you want is to treat him like dirt. Which I mean, for not to I wouldn't want to say that Lady Babs is is a cruel woman all the time, but I mean she is a lady. So treating people, you know, treating people like underlings isn't exactly out of her wheel, you know, her wheelhouse. Um, interesting. My call says Lady Jane Grey, AKA Lady Jane Dudley after her marriage as the nine days queen was a nobleman who claimed the throne of England and Ireland from the 10th to the 19th of July in 1553. That's interesting. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but that's a cool reference. <clears throat> All right, so my lady will want a warm cloak. The snow was coming down heavier than ever when they left the hall with Lady Dustin wrapped in sable. So again, this is, um, you know, it's a cloak of darkness. We've seen that sable cloak is important. Euron and Waymar both wear it. So this is specifically like the Night's King darkness cloak. And it's made from stolen skins. The sables, that's a little... It's a little weasel. So. Um, Huddled in their hooded cloaks, the guards outside were almost indistinguishable from the snowmen. So just more emphasizing the nature of the, the guards and the others here. Even in a ruined state, Winterfell is grand. A reminder the Starks are wealthier in the books than the show. Um, I guess, I mean, it's just huge stone that's surviving like everything else has been burned uh they are wealthier in the books than the show but i don't know that this is evidence of that um winterfell is just you know it's supposed to be this is fantasy it's supposed to be a impressive place and also it's symbolic of things like blood raven and the night's watch zombies things are which are dead and beat up but you can't, they're not gone yet. They're still persevering, even still. Like, that's kind of George's warrior's ethos, if you will. So only their breath fogging the air uh, gave proof that they still lived. Fires burned along the battlements, a vain attempt to drive the gloom away. Their small party found themselves slogging through a smooth, unbroken expanse of white that came halfway up their calves. The tents in the yard were half buried, sagging under the weight of the accumulation. Would you pick it up for me? The entrance to the crypts was in the oldest section of the castle, near the foot of the first keep, which had sat unused for hundreds of years. Ramsay had put it to the torch when he sacked Winterfell, and much of what had not burned had collapsed. Only a shell remained, one side open to the elements and filling up with snow. Rubble was strewn all about it, great chunks of shattered masonry, burned beams, broken gargoyles. The falling snow had covered almost all of it, but part of one gargoyle still poked above the drift, its grotesque face snarling sightless at the sky. So this is some of the language which fuels the Winterfell dragon theory. Um, The first keep is where it would have hatched out of, and here it's described as a shell. The language sounds a lot like Danny's dragon hatching scene. Mm-hmm. It's probably just a symbolic parallel because Jon Snow ultimately will be the dragon that hatches out of Winterfell, but definitely yeah. well, interesting. Since using gargoyles as a stand-in for dragons, the idea here that the snow is covering everything is a symbolic way of saying that the others are taking over everything. But, but this gargoyle 
is still poking out above the drift. So, while the others, while the snow is covering everything, the gargoyle, the dragon stand-in, is not getting covered. So that is a way of saying that the dragons uh, will not possibly, or one way, I guess, of saying that the dragons will not be covered by the others. Like, they will be the thing that stands up against it. And then, of course, that makes sense. And then there's a direct parallel to Bran. This is where they found Bran when he fell. Theon had been out hunting that day. So they're saying, you know, this gargoyle that's that's staring above the snow, this is where Bran fell. So Bran is also, like, on the team dragon that will stand up against the others. Mm. We know that's going to be the case. Because logic dictates that it will be. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, yeah, Theon had been out hunting that day, riding with Lord Eddard and King Robert, with no hint of the dire news that awaited them back at the castle. He remembered Rob's face when they told him. No one had expected the broken boy to live. The gods could not kill Bran, no more than I could. It was a strange thought, and stranger still to remember that Bran might still be alive. Oh, oh, so thought just hit me. Um, okay, so I had already brought up Zotha Mog and the White Worms trying to break him out of prison. Bran on Team Dragon is being taught by another White Worm. Again, the Worm, W-O-R-M, but the wordplay, mm -hmm. Worm, W-Y-R-M. And the Weirwood Blood Roots Raven. are like Grave Worms, lest we forget. Go yeah. ahead. But And Bloodraven is a White Dragon. He's half Targaryen. His personal sigil is a White Dragon, so... Correct. White worm, W Y R M. Yeah. So Bran and the that's this is more meshing of Bran and Theon together, but also it's so copacetic again to this Lovecraftian ideal of the star spawn when we look at the dragons also as worms and the wordplay between the different spellings between the two different types of worms. Now, do you know about this old one that's called YGG? That's the father of serpents. Yig, yeah, yeah. Yig is a that's from another uh that's from another Lovecraft tale. It's one he ghost wrote for another author, but yeah, there is Yig, and Yig is the father of serpents, and anyone who harms or kills a snake, Yig can punish them by turning them into either a snake or some kind of snake human hybrid. Cause that's one of those things, a confluence that Martin is likely to have noticed since the weirwoods are the demon tree Ig that eats people. So yeah. can the weirwood tree also be the father of serpents or the, something well, that it's like, well, there's a serpent in the roots of this tree. Yeah. Blood Raven, well, it, you know. Well, the idea of Yig, the serpent god that Lovecraft makes, is also picked up in by Robert E. Howard for his Conan tales, the Tales of Cull, uh, where the serpent men of Volusia, who, again, I've, I've talked about this, serpent men of Volusia is a Conan thing, but that sounds like Dragon Lords of Valyria, and they are one of the groups that comes into possession of the oily black stone. They are referred to in other stories as children of yig like all of these serpent men are referred to as children of yig and these serpent men again they they are holder keepers at one point keepers of the black stone so it's it's all it you see how it all just meshes together man <laughs> yes and i'm just trying to put my finger on exactly what it means for the story the end, yeah <laughs> I think that it means there will be black stone in the heart of winter. Mm-hmm. Right? Something something akin to a coffin or at right. least a sarcophagus or serving the same function. Yep, that's... Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it's going to... If we're going to see something like what Crow Food's daughter is talking about, where there's some confluence of the shade of the evening trees and the black stone that'll be revealed in the heart of winter. Um, I would be happy oh, if for a, us, so. <laughs> if, it's, if it's a grove of black and white trees growing together, that'd be great. <laughs> Basically anything, yeah. <laughs> anything along the, the lines of what this <laughs> symbolism could suggest sounds really exciting. Well, because we, we talked about the purple, there was the purple moss growing on things. Well, if there's a grove 
of shade and weirwood trees growing together, blue leaves meshing with red leaves from afar that would look purple and gray. Well, then there's also the purple moss on the weirwood in Old Town, but yeah. let's... Yeah. I'm too I'm too hard for this. Let's get back to the chapter. Um, <laughs> we're about to actually go in the crypts here, so let's let's. I need to get my Barbie voice ready, and we need to get get into this here. I'll just say purple drink gets you gray wasted. There's my tagline. I'll there tell you go. what, guys. I'm actually going to give you a funky music, and uh, because we just hit, we don't do it on these read through streams, so let me go ahead and do that, and I'll be uh, we'll be right back in like 30 seconds. Fun, fun, fun. Fraternal <laughs> Order of Grave Robbers. We're nice. heading into the crypts. <laughs> well, my shirt says uh, Yellowstone Camp Survivor, but in the corner here it says Professional Ghost Storyteller. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's get our picture back up in the corner. Come back. There we are. Huh. Um, some folks said this. All right, so Carsnark, I'm talking about PayPal's. I did not see any PayPal's except for the one that I read. If you're talking about super chats, then I just um, I've I'm, they must I must have missed them a long time ago if I missed any. But uh, all you have to do is tag me and or Carsnark with your question if I missed it, and I'll be happy to answer it. So there you go. All right, so yes. Where are we? Gods could not kill Bran. Bran might still be alive. Go ahead. There, Theon pointed to where a snowbank had crept up the wall of the keep. Under there, watch for broken stones. It took Lady Dustin's men the better part of half an hour to uncover the entrance, shoveling through the snow and shifting rubble. When they did, the, the door was frozen shut. Her sergeant had to go find an axe before he could pull it open, hinges screaming, to reveal stone steps spiraling down into darkness. Okay, so it's we're definitely way. we're definitely going into the Weirwood Cave here. So the door is frozen shut and the hinges scream open. So that's the screaming hinge sound that I've been talking about. Nissa Nissa scream. It's a raping of the Weirwood Net, which is why Aaron associates the screaming hinge with his brother coming to rape him. That's what that sound mm -hmm. means in his memory. And notice also that they have to get an ax. And an ax is what you use to cut down trees. So this is a tree cutting opening of this frozen door with a screaming hinge. And then the long spiraling steps down into darkness. Oh, yeah. So we were talking about black stone underneath the wall. So in order to... but. In order to confirm that, to reach that black, to reach that, that would require tons and tons of shoveling underneath all the snow, finally to hit the black stone. And then, same with the heart of winter, to find what lays at the heart of winter, I could imagine is going to require some, dig some digging, some shoveling of snow. But if you were to then find something like a black sarcophagus, when you 
open the door to that something that's been buried under the snow and for years and frozen uh it's gonna it's gonna sound like it's screaming when it opens it would be a god i could sort of hear it yeah it's it's a god awful yeah. sound um so okay yeah it's a long way down my lady theon cautioned lady dustin was undeterred baron bring the light oh baron that's interesting there's a baron stark mm-hmm from not he's mistaken. actually going to get mentioned later in this chapter. Yeah, and then you think of Beric. Um, it's a pet form of the ancient Germanic personal name Barrow, which means bear. So Baron is a bear name, so Bear Stark. That kind of makes sense. And then let's see. Yeah, he's a king of winter, right? No, he's actually a lord. Lord of Winterfell. Okay, why do you know that, Tim? Because oh, I'll, when we when we meant when they mentioned the statue, I'll I'll give you the history lesson. Okay, because you read this chapter <laughs> last night in preparation. Oh, and then also, yeah, Barrow. It sounds like Barrow King, Barrow Stark. Yeah, and then let me look up the name Barrick. Oh, that I think that's a thunder related word. No, not Barrick Stark. Barrick name meaning. Means barley farm. <laughs> yeah. It describes... Okay, so it derives from the same word as Wick as in Old Wick. Remember I said Old Wick means Old Town because Wick means settlement or farm? Mm-hmm. Same thing. It's it's bear as in barley and wick as in settlement. Barrick, Barrick. So hmm. it's uh yeah it's a it's a it's a name it's a farm name. So just just think about you know plants green men because the whole that's the whole thing about the green green man is he represents the green of nature's cycle. So yeah okay so Baron that's interesting. Bring the light. Um, and Baron, again, Baron means bear. So I don't know what that has to do with the light. But anyway, the way was steep and narrow and steep. The steps worn in the center by centuries of feet. They went single file, the sergeant with the lantern, then Theon and Lady Dustin, her other men, her other man behind them. He had always thought of the crypts as cold, and so they seemed in summer. But now as they descended, the air grew warmer. Not warm, never warm, but warmer than above. Down there below the earth, it would seem, the chill was constant, unchanging. And that's consistent with, I mean, that's just basic physics. People kind of make a lot of that. Oh, duh, the bear wolf brings the light down into the crypts. John is the bear wolf because he's got the bear sword and he's a wolf man. And, he's, and those two ideas get back to the um, the Berserker, which means bear warrior, and the Ulf Hednar, which means wolf warrior. And they're basically the same kind of potentially psychedelic drink imbuing wild warrior man. Just yeah, one's associated yeah. with bears and one with wolves. So yeah, the yeah. bear wolf, bear and Stark, that's just a John, that's just a John foreshadowing. Yeah. Yeah. John's got that Berserker Hulk strength. Uh, yes, I did. A couple of PayPal's did come through now for somebody who was trying. Kelly Johnson, my old friend. How does Lady Dustin hate the brother of the love of her life so much? Well, we'll get into that after she gives her tirade. And Amanda asking about Babs. Do we really think she has an actual relationship with Brandon? She seems suspect, a little too salty. I kind of think it was more a sex thing for him, and she just romanticized the whole thing. That's very possible. That's very possible. We, um, we, you know, we talk a lot about Robert, you know, I idealizing and romanticizing a version of Leanna that doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. It's women can do that too, obviously. So yeah, look. like uh, L Lady Olenna, the queen, the Queen of Thorns. Um, she says that she is the one who turned the Targaryen down, but in reality, it was. Dayron, the Targaryen who's supposed to marry, is the one who broke who broke the marriage pact because he was gay. And it really does seem she's covering up for that she oh, probably won't hurt by that. She's I read that out. differently. I read that <laughs> as like 
she made him break off the pact so she didn't look bad because she didn't want to marry him. No, I, th- I think that I think that's uh, I think that's an excuse. I think she actually was looking for. I think she wanted to marry a Targaryen, and when he, broke I could it, see that working to too. Face. Either one would yeah. be plausible. Yeah, <laughs> she made him gay. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> God, if that's what women are like, forget it. No, I, I, I just, I always, yeah, I read since she's such a string puller and, and a manipulator, and she was all like, oh. They were going to wed me to a Targaryen, but I soon put an end to that. So I just felt like she yeah. scared the crap out of him and got him to break it off so that she, because she, as a woman, she doesn't really have a right to break off the betrothal. It would have had to been her father. Yeah. So it was probably easier for her to manipulate the Targaryen. But you could be right, though. It could be the way that you're saying, yeah. too. I read it as, like, break up with me. No, I break up with you. And that's what I'm going to tell everybody. And Daeron didn't care. And he was just like, okay, whatever. I'm going to go <laughs> off with my boyfriend. <laughs> with my boyfriend. All right. So, where are we here? Constant unchanging. The bride weeps, Lady Dustin said. As they made their way down, step by careful step, our little lady, Arya. Take care now. Take care. Take care. He put one hand on the wall. The shifting torchlight made the step seem to move beneath his feet. As you say, my lady. So that's a spiral stair. If it's moving, that's now like a serpent. That's a wriggling serpent that we're climbing down. And we, we saw that there's the serpentine stairs in King's Landing that are a parallel to this. Also, there's a spiral stair going down the well underneath uh, the Red Keep that Arya uh, navigates. And I believe that is another parallel, too. Well, I will definitely say the, the chambers under King's Landing are absolutely a parallel to the Winterfell crypts. They're just the dragon version. They've got the Targaryen suits of armor with empty eye sockets that stare and follow just like the Kings of Winter. And then there's the empty eyes of the dragon skulls that also follow and watch you. And when Arya goes down in there, she thinks about the crypts. And that's where we get that bit about John hiding and covering himself in flour and emerging as a spirit moaning for blood, which is foreshadowing, obviously, of John being stolen by the others. Duh, that's one of the first places I found that idea. So yes, these are parallel locations. Um, and so we could probably draw a three-way parallel then between Blood Raven's Cave and the place under King's Landing and the Winterfell Crypts. So, yeah. The dragon suits are covered in scales. Yeah, no, they're, they're sick. Sansa sees them. Uh, and and her, her lantern that she carries seems to animate them as she walks by, which is the same thing that happens in the crypts. Whenever anybody carries a lantern, everything seems reanimated. So, mm-hmm. those suits of armor are not going to be reanimated, but they are symbolic of Night's Watchmen who are like part dragon, something like that. You know, fire whites, something along those lines. So, uh, take care now. Go ahead with that. Or, as you say, you did read that. Okay, as you yeah, say, my lady, Roos is not pleased. Tell your bastard that. He is not my bastard, he wanted to say, but another voice inside him said, He is. He is. Reek belongs to Ramsay, and, and Ramsay belongs to Reek. You must not forget your name. <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Dressing her in gray and white serves no good if the girl is left to sob. The Freys may not care, but the Northmen, they fear the Dreadfort, but they love the Starks. So right here, she's giving away that she knows it's not Arya. She's mm-hmm. like, oh, our little lady, Arya. You can dress her in gray and white, but it does no good if she's left to sob. She knows it's not Arya. Yeah. And then before that, too, like when he thinks he is not my bastard, that is a shade of the old Theon poking out. Like that is the kind of snark response Theon would say. Like, he ain't my, fr- <laughs> he ain't my bastard. He ain't my friend. But no, but then he... Has, it's it's the confliction and just like he is, he's staying meek he stay because he's staying reek right. not you said theon not you know. 
Not me, the Lady of Barrowton confessed, but the rest, yes. Old Horsebane is only here because the Freys hold the Great John captive. And do you imagine the Hornwood men have forgotten the bastard's last marriage, and how his lady wife was left to starve, chewing on her own fingers? What do you think passes through their heads when they hear the new bride weeping? Valiant Ned's precious little girl. No, he thought. She is not of Lord Eddard's blood. Her name is Jane. She is only a steward's daughter. He did not doubt that Lady Dustin suspected, but even so. Lady Arya's sobs do us more harm than all of Lord Stannis's swords and spears. If the bastard means to remain Lord of Winterfell, he had best teach his wife to laugh. My lady, Theon broke in. Here we are. The steps go farther down, observed Lady Dustin. Uh, oh, that's the end. There are lower levels, older. The lowest party is part, the, the lowest level is partly collapsed, I hear. I, I've never been down there. He pushed the door open and led them out into a long vaulted tunnel where mighty granite pillars marched two by two in the blackness. So let's see here. Um... So I do want to point out, like, yeah, she has, what she's saying is true. Like, her sobs do more harm to than, than Stannis' swords and spears. And we hear that when we hear the Northern Mountain Clan, the Northern Mountain Clan speak, like Big Bucket Wall, when they talk about going and saving the Ned's daughter, because they have such high respect for, for Ned Stark. And Big Bucket Wall gives that epic speech of like, let me let me die uh, with Bolton blood on my lips, burying my axe through their skulls. Like these men are pissed. It doesn't matter that like they, cause they think that, I mean, they think it's Arya, but like, yeah, what Ramsey is doing to Jane and them thinking it's Arya and them having that great respect for Ned, like, yeah, the, these men are pissed problem. off. Like they, they want Bolton blood. So I, br I raised just as an aside, I always make this comparison when I'm talking about Danny's situation being sold to Tro to Drogo. Um, sometimes people want to erase Danny's status as a, as a slave and a freed slave in an attempt mm -hmm. to undermine her revolutionary status, which that's one thing. Um, but what I point out is that what, what these people often say is, well, all the women that are married into these marriages are sold into marital slavery and Danny's no different. Wrong. If Drogo wants to rape and kill Danny, there are no lords that Drogo's worried about angering. There's no repercussions whatsoever. It's only because Drogo turns out to be half decent once Danny proves herself in the Dothraki way to him. Then he begins respecting her and she's able to form a different kind of... We could talk about Stockholm Syndrome versus a victim taking power and, and, and the dynamic there. But the point is that Danny doesn't have anyone... There's no political protections. Women in these sorts of situations, yes, they can be abused by their husband. And yes, Catelyn is lucky in the sense that Ned is a good person. However, the whole point of these arranged marriages in medieval society is to form alliances with the house of whom you're marrying. So if you abuse their children, that defeats the whole point of the alliance. And so only a very sadistic, and foolish person like Ramsay mm -hmm. would prioritize his own sadism. He's undermining his own alliances with his sadism, but he can't stop himself. And you see Roos telling him that, and he can't. And so this is what Barbary is bringing up too. And that shows you yeah. what sort of a malevolent psychopath Ramsay is. He can't even look out for his own best interests politically. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's why she said, "Tell, tell your bastard, you know, his, his dad's not happy," and that, and and Roos says so himself. Like again, the bastard's boys. He says to Theon, "Like, do you think they're? Do you think they're his? Do you think they're his actual friends? Like, no, they're they're all his informants. They're reporting on him. Roos knows what Ramsay is up to, and he knows that Ramsay is killing any chance of success they have for him. But he's stuck." 
knowing that Ramsey is also all he has for an heir, unless Lady Walda can bring his son to term, but he also knows that Ramsey, that if that were to happen, Ramsey's going to try and kill that baby. Yeah, and it's it also touches on this bigger topic, which we also talk about with House of the Dragon, which is just like, you know, the kings and lords, they're not above the law. It seems like they are sometimes, and they can get away with a lot of stuff, but there's always consequences. If you make people mad, if you mm-hmm. come across as unjust, cruel, irresponsible, mismanaging things, you undermine your own position. And we see that dynamic at play all over the place in House of the Dragon. But even like King Robert, he's unfaithful, right? And he doesn't, mm-hmm. he's not held to the same standard as Rhaenyra because he doesn't have the womb and Rhaenyra does, right? This is a patriarchal society, it's different. However, Robert having bastards still causes political consequences, it alienates Cersei. Uh, to him to the point that Cersei had a hand in his murder. And those children are viewed as potential political threats to Mm -hmm. his trueborn, quote-unquote, children. And that's why Cersei is going around killing them. And then we saw, like, Aegon the Unworthy. He had a bunch of bastards that were then legitimized. It caused six Blackfyre rebellions, soon to be a seventh. (laughs) So, like, (laughs) it's important to remember that the High Lord's always are at the mercy of the opinion of the common people, even though it's a medieval society and we think of the commoners as having less rights and stuff. Like, in some ways, the threat of a peasant revolt is a more is more of a check on wealth and inequality than anything that we have now, if you think about it. I don't want to get too lost on a side. Like, the wealth inequality now is worse than most medieval societies. And we the the rich people are not afraid of a peasant revolt at this point. So just think about that. Anyway, let's keep going. Where were we? Are you, unless you have comments on peasants' revolt and uh, consent of the governed and all that. I mean, I, I long for the day the guillotine comes out of retirement. I don't know. I mean, the penal- the, these corporations, at the very least, should get the, the death penalty. Like, their charter should be revoked if we're not actually executing the CEOs of these companies <laughs> that are costing uh, us so yeah. much money, you know, by their malfeasance. But anyway. Yeah. These are... <laughs> I mean, that's actually... That's an opinion that people on the left and the right can agree on. You know, holding malfeasant bankers and corporations accountable. It's just a matter of how we do that. And what's yeah. appropriate, but yeah. in any case, <laughs> and now for something completely different, <laughs> Lady does. So here we go. Lady Dustin Sargent raised the lantern. Sergeant Baron. Shadows slid and shifted, a small light in a great darkness. So that is Azor High language specifically. A small light in a great darkness. Melisandre says, even an ember in the ashes can spark a great blaze. So that's the same thing. So Baron, remember, Baron is, Baron Stark means Bear Stark. So this is a John parallel character. He's bringing the light into the crypts, which seems to reanimate. This kind of makes sense, right? Like, remember, the idea of the, of the Kings of Winter reanimating in the crypts very well could simply refer to Green Zombie Night's Watchmen. That could very well be the whole summation of what it's talking about. So John is simply reanimating his other fire whites. Kinda. If we're following the parallel here. So, Theon had never felt comfortable in the crypts, and neither does John, of course. He could feel the Stone King staring down at him with their stone eyes, Stone fingers curled around the hilts of rusted longswords. None had any love for Ironborn. A familiar sense of dread filled him. So many, Lady Dustin said. Do you know their names? Once, but that was a long time ago, Theon pointed. The ones on this side were kings in the north. Torin was the last. The king who knelt. 
I, my lady. After him, there were only lords. Until the young wolf. Where is Ned Stark's tomb? At the end. This way, my lady. That's like just getting right down to it. She's like, show me Ned's tomb so I can hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and read here. Their footsteps echoed through the vault as they made their way between the row of the rows of pillars. The stone eyes of the dead men seemed to follow them, and the eyes of their stone dire wolves as well. The faces stirred faint memories. A few names came back to them, unbidden, whispered in the ghostly voice of Maester Lewin. King Edric Snowbeard, who had ruled the north for a hundred years. And who Brandon, again and who built the outer wall, which might be hmm. a clue about Starks building the ice wall. Go ahead. And the first victim of Elio and Linda's AI shenanigans on the wiki. Oh, uh, I don't know if it's the first, but definitely a <laughs> the victim. Only one I know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> the only one I know of so far. Uh, mm. Brandon the shipwright, who had sailed beyond the sunset. Theon Stark, the hungry wolf. My namesake. Lord Baron Stark, who made common cause with Casterly Rock to war against Dagon Greyjoy, Lord of Pike, in the days when the Seven Kingdoms were ruled in all but name by the bastard sorcerer men called Bloodraven. Okay, yeah, so here, here's where the history lesson comes in. So these four, three of them are kings of winter, except for Baron, who's a lord. So King Edric Snowbeard, he's the one who he said built the outer wall, and if the tales are to be believed, he ruled for a hundred years. Um, Brandon, the shipwright, yeah, he he is uh, king of the north, king of the north, who wanted to sail across the sunset sea, which is the ending that the show gives to Arya. But he decides, oh, I'm, he he does what uh, um, what. Gilbert Farwin suggests, like, sail to the west. <laughs> but he never, but he never came back. He never came back. So then his son becomes Brandon the Burner, and he burns the Winterfell fleet, like because his father sailed away and never came back. Um, so and then that's not, yeah. And this this is a parallel to the end of the story. Okay, so Brandon the shipwright, and then Brandon the Burner. Think about Blood Raven as Bran's father, because Blood Raven is Brynden, and Bran is Brandon. So Blood Raven is Brynden the shipwright. He mm -hmm. is sailing beyond the sunset, meaning he is going to he is going to join the Weirwood Net, sailing beyond that, sailing into the sea and out of sight. That is the same as like going into the Green Sea. Okay, but his son. Well, bar like Brandon the Burner burned the fleet so that no one could sail the Green Sea ever again. That's the Weirwood yeah. download. Bran Stark will have the Weirwood <laughs> net downloaded into his Bran brain, and no one will ever, no human will ever be a Green Seer again. So yeah. that is that is a direct parallel. Go, what are you laughing I, at? I just thought of sticks. I'm sailing away. <laughs> I don't know I sticks, know but. You don't know sailing. Oh, come sail away. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Okay, so all right. Well, anyway, back to back to our history lesson. So Theon Stark, he is the uh so he's like a preserver of the old gods because he's the one who stops the Andal invasion and then takes the fight back to Andalos and he like stakes those guys out on the beach. Because so Theon know. Theon means like a divine instrument, essentially. Theos is you know god or divine godly so a theon is a god thing um yeah. and so that's why theon is becoming an instrument of the old gods here and theon stark was a fierce defender of the old gods yeah. and of the sea and so it's because of theon stark that the andal invasion kind of stops at the north not to say they didn't have an influence because obviously southern influences are there in the north like how they speak the common tongue but they were able to keep their own religion. That's thanks to Theon Stark. And then lastly, Lord Baron Greyjoy, I mean, Lord Baron Stark, he is the one who gathers swords to fight Dagon Greyjoy, the last Reaver. So, because we've done Duncan Egg, uh, Dunk is told like three separate times, like, oh, you should go to Winterfell. Lord Stark is gathering swords to fight the Ironborn. This is him, Baron Stark. So if Dunk and Egg are to go to Winterfell, like in She-Wolves of Winterfell, 
Baron Stark would be the one that they're uh, offering their service to. He's the one who takes the fight to Dagon Greyjoy. And Dagon Greyjoy is important, obviously, because Theon's here, he's Ironborn, but now his uncle, Euron, is like the second coming of Dagon Greyjoy, because Dagon Greyjoy okay. is like that, make the Iron Island. when's the last time the Iron Islands are great? Oh, it was, it was when Dagon was in charge, when he was re, when he was raiding and reaving during the time of Bloodraven, because Bloodraven was so focused on the East. Okay, so switching gears to the foreshadowing of John, Lord Baron Stark, that's that's John Bear Stark. Mm -hmm. um, makes common cause with Casterly Rock, i.e., Jamie and Brienne, and potentially Tyrion with Danny, to war against Dagon Greyjoy, who would be Euron, Euron. and or the others, whom Euron might command by blowing the mm -hmm. Horn of Winter, which is the little one. This is what I figured out recently. Have we talked about that? This is a new theory I came up with on my iceberg. Um, we've talked a lot of Euron stuff. Like, what specifically? That, that the little gonna... horn that they found at the Fist of the First Men, that it did call, they blew it, and it called the others oh, and... to the Fist of the First Men, and that's why it's an we old town. Have... We have talked about that, that it might be a dog whistle for the others, and that's why it didn't make, maybe it did make a sound, it's just not one that people can hear. It's dog whistle. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why Euron has it, because he eventually will use it to command the others. And that's how he'll do it. Um, this is that's the rest of the theory. So um, now the important thing here, the most important thing is that there is a Theon Stark in the crypts who is a king of winter. That just tells you Theon, who was turning into the Grey King and thinks about himself as a Stark. We should compare him to the Grey King and the Kings of Winter, meaning mm -hmm. the, it's the same thing. The Grey King, who turned a th lived for a thousand years and sat on a weird throne and turned gray into a statue, that's the same thing the Kings of Winter are doing. Sitting in weird thrones, turning into statues. Like, it's a huge clue, the fact that there's a Theon Stark in the crypts who's a King of Winter. So, yeah. especially with this chapter and all the context of what's going on. But um, let's, keep, let's keep reading. Oh, and then the last part of the John parallel, when the Seven Kingdoms is ruled by Blood Raven. It's like, yeah, Blood Raven will be helping to coordinate a lot of this stuff. You know, John fighting against Euron. We will see how long Blood Raven holds out for, but. That king is missing his sword, Lady Dustin observed. It was true. Theon did not recall which king it was but the long sword he should have held was gone. Streaks of rust remained to show where it had been. This is the sword that Hodor has. When Bran and company leave the crypt, Hodor has a rusty sword. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the, the sight disquieted him. He had always heard that the iron and the sword kept the spirits of the dead locked within their tombs. If a sword was missing, there are ghosts in Winterfell, and I am one of them. So, again... That's another clue. Theon is like the Kings of Winter, mm. one of which is named after him. There are ghosts like, oh, the Kings of Winter ghosts might be free. And then he thinks there are ghosts here and I'm one of them too. So again, Theon, a King of Winter is a parallel. Yeah. And this, this is also the iron and the sword kept the spirits of the dead within their tombs. Like this is some old school ghost stories. The idea of things like iron and salt are supposed to keep ghosts either at bay or, or entombed or pegged down into where they're sealed. Right. So, okay. So they walked on Barbara Dustin's face seemed to harden with every step. She likes this place no more than I do. Oh, this is you. Theon heard himself say, my lady, why do you hate the Starks? So this is just like the million dollar question that Barbary's just been waiting for someone to ask. It's just like, oh, <laughs> you'd like to know that. Well, there's uh, <clears throat> let me cue up my diatribe. She studied him for the same reason you love them. Theon stumbled. Love them? I never... I took this castle from them, my lady. 
I, I had I had Brandon Rickon put to death, mounting their heads on spikes. I rode south with Rob Stark, fought beside him at the Whispering Wood and River Run, returned to the Iron Islands as his envoy to treat with your own father. Barrowton sent men with the young wolf as well. I gave him as few men as I dared, but I knew that I must needs give him some or risk the wrath of Winterfell, so I had my own eyes and ears in that host. They kept me well informed. I know who you are. I know what you are. Now answer my question. Why do you love the Starks? I... Theon put a gloved hand against a pillar. I wanted to be one of them. And never could. We have more in common than you know, my lord. But come. Only a little farther on, three tombs were closely grouped together. That was where they halted. Lord Rickard, Lady Dustin observed, studying the central figure. The statue loomed above them, long-faced, bearded, solemn. He had the same stone eyes as the rest, but his looked sad. He lacks a sword as well. It was true. Someone has been down here stealing swords. Brandon's is gone as well. He would hate that. She pulled off her glove and touched his knee, pale flesh against dark stone. Brandon loved his sword. He loved to hone it. I want it sharp enough to shave the hair from a woman's cunt, he used to say. And how he loved to use it. A bloody sword is a beautiful thing, he told me once. You knew him? Theon said. I just realized Lady Barbary wouldn't wouldn't do Brandon's voice. She would say it in her own voice, so I apologize for that. Um, I probably would say that when they come out with sword, like I said, Hodor has the rusty one. Brand's, though, is more... The one that Brand takes is newer and still sharp, so it was probably Bran who took his uncle Brandon's sword. Makes sense that he would take the sword from his namesake. <clears throat> That's cool. And so Hodor has who? We don't know whose sword Hodor has. No, just that he has one of the four. It's one of the four they mentioned. It's either so either Bear, either Baron Starks or Edric Snowbeards or Theon or. Uh, well, it's got to be Snowbeards because um, he Hodor gets a Snowbeard, and he gets Ice Eyes too. But I think he's just really archetypal King of Winter when he gets that sword. I don't know if it matters which one. Anyway. The lantern light in her eyes made them seem as if they were a fire. Brandon was fostered at Barrowton with old Lord Dustin, the father of the one I'd later wed, but he spent most of his time riding the rills. He loved to ride. His little sister took after him in that. A pair of centaurs, those two. And my lord father was always pleased to play host to the heir to Winterfell. My father had great ambash ambitions for House Riswell. He would have served up my maidenhead, to any Stark who happened by, but there was no need. Brandon was never shy about taking what he wanted. I am old now, a dried-up thing, too long a widow, but I still remember the look of my maiden's blood on his cock the night he claimed me. I think Brandon liked the sight as well. A bloody sword is a beautiful thing, yes. It hurt, but it was a sweet pain. Oh, one second here, hang on. The day I learned that Brandon was to marry Catelyn Tully, though, there was nothing sweet about that pain. He never wanted her, I promise you that. He told me so on our last night together. But Rickard Stark had great ambitions, too. Southron ambitions, they would not be served by having his heir marry the daughter of one of his own vassals. Afterward, my father nursed some hope of wedding me to Brandon's brother Eddard, but Catelyn Tully got that one as well. I was left with young Lord Dustin, until Ned Stark took him from me. Robert's Rebellion. Lord Dustin and I had not been married half a year when Robert rose and Ned Stark called his banners. I begged my husband not to go. He had kin he might have sent in his stead. An uncle famed for his prowess with an axe. A great uncle who had fought in the War of the Nine Penny Kings. But he was a man and full of pride, and nothing would serve but that he led the Barrowton levies himself. I gave him a horse the day he set out, a red stallion with a fiery mane, the pride of my lord father's herds. My lord swore that he would ride him home when the war was done. 
Ned Stark returned the horse to me on his way back to Winterfell. He told me that my lord had died an honorable death, that his body had been laid to rest beneath the red mountains of Dorne. He brought his sister's bones back north, though, and there she rests. But I promise you, Lord Eddard's bones will never rest beside hers. I mean to feed them to my dogs. Theon did not understand. His... his bones? Her lips twisted. It was an ugly smile, a smile that reminded him of Ramsay's. Catelyn Tully dispatched Lord Eddard's bones north before the Red Wedding, but your iron uncle seized Moat Caelan and closed the way. I have been watching ever since. Should those bones ever emerge from the swamp, they will get no farther than Barrowton. She threw one last lingering look at the likeness of Eddard Stark. We are done here. She literally just came down there to have a two minutes hate. Like Orwell style. <laughs> two minutes hate at Ned's death. That's the only reason this whole thing was just so she could visit the statue and be like, Puh. <laughs> I love that. That's so, yeah. that's so real, you know? It's petty yeah, it, and it's real. <laughs> it's the way to, because everyone's been spitting on Theon and then she makes him bring her down there so that she can spit on someone else, essentially. And interesting, re remind Theon of Ramsay, you know, just that look of just pure hate and malevolence. The snowstorm was still raging when they emerged from the crypts. Lady Dustin was silent during their ascent, but when they stood beneath the ruins of the first keep again, she shivered and said, You would do well not to repeat anything I might have said down there. Is that understood? It was. Hold my tongue or lose it. Roos has trained you well. She left him there. So... <laughs> <laughs> Give in to your hate, young Lady Dustin. Too late. It's too late. She already did. Already did. Um, real quick, Kelly Johnson said, The Starks are synonymous with the North, but there were cracks in their power they never noticed. The Boltons, Lady Dustin, waiting in the wings to stab them in the back. Yeah, it's kind of always the case. You never have total peace. You know, there's always some people with grudges out there. The Boltons in particular, obviously, um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, that's all better now. We're not enemies anymore. And it's like, well, you haven't seen that hidden chamber down in the Dreadfort where they still have the skins of Starks hanging up on hooks. So if Rob had known about that, maybe he never would have trusted Roos. thing is it's like he he even admits the cat like roos scared the hell out of him yeah and but then catelyn's like good maybe we can put that to use which again is catelyn's like not always having the best ideas but also little choice go. like you need every mm -hmm. ally that you can to go to war in the south because the northerners are it's just a less populous area they have smaller yeah. armies Inu says he had a two minutes hate at a can opener this weekend. I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah. So, she, yeah, regrettable muffin. So that totally wasn't the only reason. She also wanted to find a secret way out. Yeah, yeah. Because like I said, they make it. He, it's been made a point that the Boltons have this place on lockdown. So, okay, they are, I buy that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I buy that. That there was a dual purpose. And she's even clever enough to be running all this banter so that Theon doesn't notice that she's, you know, casing the joint, mm. essentially. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing, because... And that's why she needs to do this, manipulate Theon as much to do this, because, again, it's been drilled into Theon's head that any opportunity for escape is no, it's not real. It's just a game. There is no escape. Like Ramsey has Ramsey's thought of it all, but no. So if he, if he knew that that's what she was really doing, looking for a way out, he'd be even more reluctant to, to come down there with her because he would think that 
she's in on it just like how he was saying before like no no they're all they're all laughing at me they're all in on it everyone's he's having those paranoid those paranoid thoughts um yeah i i think i think that makes total sense uh and the thing is that like the hate is so genuine here so it's definitely mm. like if it's serving as a cover, it's a genuine cover. Like it's, it really was a dual purpose visit. Um, and no, Jaharis can't be cold hands. Jaharis was burned on a funeral pyre, and cold hands is a skin changer. And Tar Targaryens are not skin changers, unless they are Blackwoods. So as I'm not for... sure where that theory came from, but I would say no. So then Ash Meadow Phoenix says, like, the swamp, does Hallin have them? Because here she says, do the bones ever come up from that swamp? Now, she's referring to Moat Kalen. However, there were two other people that Rob, that Rob Stark, before the Red Wedding, dispatched to Greywater Watch. He sends Mage Mormont and Galbart Glover with that letter to to go spy to, or not to spy to go see uh howland reed down at gray water watch that was before the red wedding since then their whereabouts are unknown so when they say the swamp like even though they're meeting moat kalen that could also mean though that something is going that if something resurfaces up in winterfell from the swamp maybe it's actually something that's coming out of gray water watch yeah if, when mage and galbert return definitely i take it to refer to the whole neck um yeah for sure so and then did, yeah coming out of the swamp i mean we know what comes out of the goddamn swamp don't we tim yeah. and galbart as for that galbart glover may have resurfaced because he's one of the candidates for the hooded man in the next theon chapter that's the one that makes the most sense to me in fact yeah galbert glover mm -hmm. The North's 007. <laughs> Secret agent Galbert Glover turns up in the wolf's den with Wyman Manderley. Fucking badass, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Which is another then, chapter we got to read, that wolf's den chapter. But cool. Well, last call for questions, and then we'll, we'll get out of here. And uh, like I said, there will be a new video this week, guys. I'm not even going to tell you the topic, but it's going to be another one in the Disaster Hunters series. It's not the Ironborn video, but it's going to be very exciting. And it will have the words Timeline Heresy attached to it. Now, I know how you guys like that. So look out for that on Tuesday if I'm very productive, more likely Thursday. So, Kelly Johnson, I think I answered both your PayPals, homie. Uh, it's one about the Starks. Yeah, refresh, I just answered. And you sent one and asked about how does Lady Dustin hate the brother of the love of her life so much? Well, I think the chapter um, just, there's there's not more PayPal's. I answered them all. Um, how does Lady Dustin hate the brother of the love of her life so much? Yeah, I mean, it, she explained it. You know, and I think the other question probably helped explain it too. Like when you say love of her life, you know, it seems more like an obsession or something and tied into the idea that she wanted to be a Stark. So it's very much a status thing, you know, um, it, it's just, a it's, she's formed a, she's a spurned lover that she looks at the Starks as having spit on her house. That's the thing. It's not just Brandon and Ned. It's like the house as a whole took her virginity, used her while she was young and then discarded her and never married her. Neither one of them married her. And so her anger now is directed towards Ned. I guess that's the best way I could answer that. But I pretty much think that she's pretty straightforward in how she explained it there. Yeah, would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, like she makes it very obvious. Like she's met, she's pissed off at Ned and Catelyn in particular. She's jealous of Cat. As she said, it's like because she, uh, she. I mean, it's 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 more, she's mad at Brandon's father because he's the one that 
force this ma this marriage for his solitary ambitions, but she's still jealous of Cat that Cat was supposed to marry Bran. Then she says, like, well, maybe I would have married one of his, you know, Ned, but then she took him too. And <laughs> I mean, there was always Benjen, but then Benjen uh, joined the Night's Watch, so marriage is never not an option for him. Yeah, think about the symbol, the symbolic message of Ned not even bringing Lord Riswell's uh, bones back. Yeah, it's just it's the cap on the whole thing of the Starks treating this house without respect. Um, the thing is, it was a bunch of different Starks, and so none of them had the whole picture in their mind. But from the Riswell's perspective, again, Brandon used her up while she was young. Then nobody married her. And then when she did get married to a different guy, Ned took him off to war and didn't even have the courtesy to bring the bones back. And then was like, oh, he died valiantly. And she's like, yeah, fuck that. Yeah. But he brought his, si but he brought his sister's bones back. He had so made sure that they came back. Yeah, so it's understandable. Like, I mean, not, not to the extent she's taken it, but you can see how the lines like connect on that, you know, to make a yeah. picture of a grudge. So... Yeah, and then there's also because there were three others too that died with her husband. Like it was Ned, Halland, and four other guys. So he didn't bring their bones back either. There's four men based essentially buried that he took with him, buried under the Tower of Joy. Yeah, and then he brought Leanna's bones back because that's important for Night's Queen symbolism. But also, it, it yeah, it it, it it just yeah, it's unfortunate. You could see why Ned did it that way, but you can see why she's pissed about it. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the Starks aren't perfect. I mean, that's we know that. And Brandon in particular was never shy about claiming what he wanted. He was you know, privileged. He was entitled. He was you know, uh, mm -hmm. some of the traits that make for very problematic lords and kings Brandon had. Yeah. Now Something I want to note on is, is Theon's, how he says, like, well, I want it to be one of them, but he couldn't. And this is hard because we, we're going off of this history between the Iron Islands and the North. There's been just decades, centuries, really, of animosity, constant back and forth warfare. Um, but at the same time, a shared history. It's why for as different as the North and the Ironborn are, they also have a lot in common which we're seeing with all this gray king symbolism that comes up in the Stark crypts. But for Theon's part, he is, I mean, I'm not sure if they tell the exact age when he was sent to be a ward of Ned Stark, but it was at a very, very young age. We know that. He's probably been with the Starks longer than he was with the Ironborn, which is why he's seen as such a, a, a foreigner, an alien, when he returns home. Because he's more, in their eyes, you're more Northmen than Ironborn. You know, you've never been here. And the show, when the show was good, the show did a great job of, of showing that when Theon has that outburst with Bale and Greyjoy. Like, you know, you, you sent me away like like a dog that you didn't want anymore. Like when Bale and Sam, like, we, we pay the iron price. And he's like, we don't sell. And, he's like, and Theon's like, bullshit, you kneeled. You gave me up to save your own ass. Like, that is the truth of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always, I feel real, I feel so horrible for Theon in that moment when he comes back to Pike and is rejected so hard by his dad. Mm -hmm. That's just awful, man. I, I continue to wonder about George's relationship with his father. <laughs> but uh, um, to get, to think about, to wrap up the sort of the symbolism with the Grey King Theon stuff here in this chapter. Um, Oh, man, I just had a thought. Oh, the bones. Okay, so people are talking about the bones. The bones, remember, remember the, the you know, the whites only stop moving when you break their bones and Summer drinks the marrow and stuff. So, like, the there's something about bones that are very magical in this mm. story. Um, so Ned, Ned insisting on bringing Leanna's bones back could be a little bit of a cargo cult tradition thing where originally... 
super important to have the bones in the crypts because they're going to get frozen into the weirwood net. You know what I mean? So even all these years later, when Ned doesn't remember that that's the tradition, it's still there's a stark feeling that like the bones have to be in the crypts. And Ned's like, oh, she should have been on a hill. And Ned's like, no, this is her place. Like the stark mm -hmm. bones have to be in the crypts. There's something sacred about that tradition that Ned understands even in a general sense, but which we can kind of extrapolate back to this idea of the first Kings of Winter potentially being green seers on Weirwood Thrones. Yeah, and George has right two sisters if you really want to go there, Mike. <laughs> but yeah, that's right up there with the, uh, there always needs to be a Stark in Winterfell. It's like whether living or dead, that's where they need to be. I don't understand the question here. What will happen during the, in the East during the long night? Nothing that's going to be relevant to the story that we're really going to hear about, although there is Grey Plague uh, in Yi-T. Mm. Elaborate on the Barrowton dead situation, please. I don't know what you mean by that either. Um, that's Barrowton is definitely symbolism. So when you say elaborate on, I'm not sure what you want me to elaborate on. I it's mean, just they're essentially used for corpse symbolism in chapters like this when we saw the Barrowton yeah. man, you know, being pelted with snow. Yeah, it's death. <laughs> I guess Bar Barrowton's like, it's like Death City uh, because of the symbolic aspect of corpses and corpse kings and Night's Queen, one of the maesters' uh, uh, ideas of what, uh, when, when they're trying to explain it all away with logic and reason, is saying that she was probably a daughter of a Barrow King and that makes her a corpse queen. Pelted with snow. That's a good one. I'd never noticed that before. It's pretty cool. All right. Well, um, so what do you, so yeah, with those snowmen, I mean, that's the best situation. Like you said it yourself, the, the Lords that were created to, to command the snowmen are all people that are going to turn against symbolic night King Roos and Ramsey. So that really makes me think like the green zombies might have a way of not commanding the others, but, controlling them maybe with that damn horn or maybe mm -hmm. John being whited or frozen is how he commands them. Uh, th I've talked about that as an end of the story possibility. John and or Danny could both become night King and queen to lead the others back into the weirwood net or something. But <clears throat> yeah. Chat's just going on how they can't believe you don't know sticks. Or I, that's a little away. before my time. I'm not super <laughs> into like 80s butt rock and hair metal stuff. I only know a little bit of that. <laughs> I like 80s pop, but not so much like the metal stuff. Mm -hmm. That's why I was like, very old Metallica is great. Like, actually, it's good. Like, I don't really like Metallica, but the old stuff is worth listening to. Is kind of what I was saying, so... That's seventies mm. prog rock. Sticks? Sticks is seventies prog rock? Like very late seventies, right? And I don't know about prog. Are they prog, Tim? Yeah, like Mr. Roboto is a is part of a whole rock opera about how some guy has to go in the future and he's okay. gonna save the world with the power of rock. Okay, that's verified prog subject matter then. Yeah, I get that shows you how little I know about the band. Yeah. Cartman sings it. I know that doesn't make me know the song. I'd recognize the slowly demodding myself. I said, I don't really like Metallica. I don't dislike them. I'm just not like a, I don't bump them. Like I'm not, a, I never have been a Metallica fan so much. Oh, whoa. But yeah. even I oh. can admit that that old shit fucking rules. If you turn it up on a good stereo, it is fierce. I will you know. say the lyrics, the lyrics to Blackened sound exactly like Long Night imagery. <laughs> yeah, we went, we've talked about that. It's <laughs> that's uncanny. <laughs> Timeline heresies. Give us another hint. I mean, that was a pretty good hint. Um, let's see. 
It's it's definitely <laughs> some of the subject matter that was in the video, um, the three hour live stream called Timeline Heresy, The Pact and the Hammer of the Waters. I covered a lot of ground in that, but think about the order of the series I'm doing here. Like I did Hammer of the Waters and Moat Kalen. I've opened up this idea that the hammer was a meteor of some kind. So there is some timeline heresy to address. The timeline heresy is calling sticks 80s hair metal. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> that's pretty good, though. That's well played, Daniel. That's very well played. It is timeline heresy. That's exactly what that is. If my manager's watching this, he'll be upset about this as well. I'm sorry, I don't know the band. They sound like an 80s band, Sticks. <laughs> but yeah, what that, that album sounds like Prague. Did they turn into 80s hair metal? Did they do Prague and then sort of shift over? Or like, am I just for some, just that a wild misassociation? I mean, it got Did they wear really tight weird. tight leopard skin pants or anything? Like, what are we talking about here? <laughs> All I know is it got really weird with Kil when they did the Kilroy thing, and that basically killed their career. But um, I would just watch the Trade Records episode on that for more for more information on that one. Very good, very good. Yeah, I do like um, some '70s prog. I definitely do. I'm not like a prog historian though, or anything like that. So uh, I'm I'm Tim. Well, I I, I think I told you this. Uh, my dad is a huge prog fan. King Crimson, Rush. Uh, my name, Timoth I'm Timothy Leary, because of Moody Blues' Legend of a Mind. See, I like King Crimson a lot more than Rush. Rush is mm. cool, um, and I don't, again, don't dislike Rush, but I don't bump Rush. I listen to King Crimson regularly. Um, Emerson, yeah. Lake, and Palmer also I listen to regularly. So For me, Papa was a prog rocker, Mama is a punk, and that's what's influenced my musical taste. Basically, I like... I like late 60s, early 70s prog more than late 70s prog is kind of what I'm saying. So anyway, I guess we're done with the stream here. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are watching? 370. Now, I guess this is still interesting. Yeah, you guys don't even know the band. I'm into Soft Machine. You guys don't know Soft Machine. I'd be surprised if there's a single person besides Carl Karsnark, maybe. Who knows the band Soft Machine? That's what I'm into. That's very, er, very late 60s, early 70s. Prague. Okay, he's into Soft Machine. I'm staying old. Of course, a new Aurora knows them. He's old like my dad, yeah. <laughs> King Crimson, I'm totally into Crimson. But again, I'm, like, I'm bumping 21st century schizoid man too, not just like the newer stuff. Like the like, I listen to Adrian Ballou's solo shit. So, anyway, <laughs> um, Vandergraaf Generator. No, I've not heard of them. So Zappa's like, I can't really get into Zappa. Zappa's a little too like kooky for me somehow. I don't know. I mean, some of it's like pretty good, but I've never gotten into it. No. And yes, I still listen to At The Drive-In. Absolutely, I do. Yeah, see, Genesis is uber prog, but that's that's like, yeah, late 70s prog. That's kind of like starting to sound pretty 80s-ish, and then I get kind of like, meh, about that. <laughs> so that's the thing. is like, if you listen to Soft Machine and King Crimson, like, that groove is hard. Like, the rhythm section is driving. It's intense. It's not like Cooktown, you know, like it's just not. Um, it's it's a very intense jam. Um, so I really like, you know, uh, like Weather Report is a band. I like most of their stuff when they play, when they jam hard. And there's some of the Weather Report stuff that's a little too like ethereal for me. But um, Return to Forever, I could definitely get down on that. Definitely. That's a band that like I've been me I would mean to listen to more, but I've never I've never listened to them enough, but everything I've heard from them is really good. Who's the bass player on Return for Forever? He's a he's one of the legends. Uh I just forget which 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 is uh 
Which legendary bass player is on which one? Yeah, Jocko and Weather Report, obviously. That's, that's my shit. And I listen to all Jocko's solo stuff. I mean, I'm a big Jocko fan. I've got a Fender Jazz bass right here, so of course I love Jocko. I had to get a certain amount of good just to be able to hear Jocko. Okay, so yeah, Stanley Clark has returned to forever. So yeah, I love Stanley. I'm more familiar with Stanley's solo stuff than Return to Forever, but I've definitely heard some of that. Like, I can play some School Days if you want. Oh, down to Clarny Brown. I am very familiar with Johnny Hobo and the Freight Trains. I love... <laughs> Uh, that was before everyone moved to New Mexico. I love Johnny Hobo. I don't know that one. I do like Peter Gabriel. He's like very clever. I, I almost like his solo stuff probably more than Genesis. In fact, I'd probably say that's true. What about newer Prague? Um, well, I'm big into Tool and Animals as Leaders. Mastodon's um, a little too metally for me. Coheed and Cambria, I'm not as much into. I've only heard a little bit um, of that, though. I'm seeing Tool in November. They're coming up here. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. We're just turning this into a, a music hangout now. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Whatever. <laughs> and and Mast Mastodon, I've seen them live three times. I, I like Mastodon. Mastodon is like the secret member of Animals as Leaders anyway. he That guy writes a lot <laughs> of their riffs, and they work together. Back to the topic. The topic's over, Anu. We're done. It's all... <laughs> The others are snowmen on the wall, just like the Sentinels, you know. And I do want to emphasize that. Like, we've talked about the 79 Sentinels as symbolic others a bunch of times. Direct parallels to this, you know, to these snowmen. No, Anu, Anu is just, he's just trolling. Anu has a great sense of humor. I saw Rage Front Row once. I climbed a fence and broke into a Rage concert once. It was a Rage Wu-Tang concert. And I have a little <laughs> scar that you probably can't see on my forearm from climbing over the fence. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I have, I was I have talked to Glidus about doing a music stream. Because Glidus is a very talented musician, more yeah. talented than me, and a great singer. I was going to take my mom to see Social Distortion. She's a big Social Distortion fan. They were supposed to come up my way back in July, but Mike Ness uh, announced he has throat cancer, and that's been postponed. So looking into when the tour gets back up, she's a huge... She's a huge Social Distortion fan, and I've seen them live. So I'll actually take that's that's gonna be a weird one for me because take my sixty year old mom to a punk show. But I said she was a punk, she was a seventies eighties punk, and that's really influenced my love of it. <laughs> and yeah, they did cut the Rage Wu Tang uh, tour short, De Clowny. <clears throat> yeah, that was that was a lot of people did miss that one, and then Rage broke up, and that was it. Um, Tim, what are the what's name like some of the most impressive bands that you have seen live? Flogging Molly put on a good show. Um, I've, I've seen, seen Flogging Molly on a side stage at Warp Tour in like '97. Go ahead. Uh, I was at Ozfest for when it was being co-headlined by Black Sabbath, like not not just Ozzy, original lineup Black Sabbath. So Ozzy, Tony Iommi. Uh, Geezer Butler and Bill Ward. Uh, I remember my feet. I was wearing these really shitty boots and my feet started bleeding. But I was like, I can't sit down. I need to stand up and give Ozzy and Iomi the, the respect they deserve. But they were also co-headlining with Iron Maiden. So it was, so I got Zach Wilde, then Iron Maiden, then Black Sabbath. One right after the other, all in one night. And we were lucky because uh, there was a second OzFest show the next day at the same place, but Ozzy tires easily and he had jet lag. So Iron Maiden headline. I got there on the night where both of them played. So I got to see them both. 
Somebody mentioned chili peppers on Californication. I saw chili peppers at um, the Tibetan Music Festival <laughs> in 98 or something. It was the one where lightning struck inside the stadium and killed somebody. And that was the loudest sound I've ever heard. Um, a lightning strike inside of a football stadium. I was like halfway across the stadium from it. And it sounded like a gun that was about a mile tall being fired in the sky. It's an unbelievable thing to hear lightning that close. The show, I saw Chili Peppers, uh, Pearl Jam, Beastie Boys. Uh, I saw members of Pearl Jam playing with the Chili Peppers. We saw uh uh, Dave Matthews Band was there for for anybody thrilled about that. Um, yeah, so let's see. Uh, keep going with your list, though. Well, uh, like I said I've seen Mastodon a number of times. Seen Opeth live. That was great. Um, who else have I seen? Uh, um, I've seen. I well, no going based opposite and worst shows i've seen actually rob zombie uh rob zombie puts on a bad show you can, can tell i like, can see that you know how like sometimes a singer will hold out the microphone for pe the audience to sing lines for them rob zombie does that for like every other word the man is haggard like he can't even sing his own songs for himself anymore so ugh. <laughs> But, and that's the thing, because I've been to a lot of festivals, so I've seen, like, good acts and bad acts side by side, because it all depends on how, just how up the snuff they are that day. So one band that I have seen that is very much, well, I can think of two bands that can sound very good or very bad. Um, Deftones mm -hmm. used to be that Chino drank too much at a lot of his shows, and, like, it was 50-50 at a Deftones show whether or yeah. not Chino would be too drunk to really give a good performance. He sobered up at a certain point and does much better now. Um, if anyone sees Deftones now, that won't be a thing. But I remember one time seeing him at the Capitol Ballroom in D.C., and we saw him drinking in the sound booth before during the opening act, and me and my lead singer in my band were like, oh, I don't know, this doesn't look good. <laughs> and it wasn't. Um, but Deftones has, I've seen them many times and many great shows. Uh, and the other one is Mars Volta, not because of alcohol, just because they're so complex and their instrumentation is so much and their songs are so ambitious. It barely holds together on the record. Um, so I've seen them at Greek theater and it was perfect. And I've seen them at a club where it was just a mess. Um, I saw them at Bill Graham on New Year's on Mushrooms uh one time that was like 2005 or so that was a fun show um he came out in like an aztec headdress um at the beginning that was interesting uh, let's see i uh, you get you remembered any other shows now that i talked for a minute uh i was at Sl slayer there were there during the farewell tour so slayer lamb of god behemoth and anthrax all in one go and Behemoth did really well. That was after uh, Nurgle had recovered from his leukemia, took some time off and to recover and came back and was like, okay, I got to make up for lost time now. And he killed it. Uh, he sounded great after everything he'd been through, put on a fantastic show. You and like that heavy Slayer, stuff. Yeah. And then when Slayer ended, like Tom Morey is just like, I'll miss you. And we're all just like, then don't leave. Don't stop. But no, nah, he wants to spend time with his kids and his grandkids, he says. Yeah, that's legit, man. That's legit. Um, yeah, J.L. Warad says he saw a poor Mars Volta. It really depends on the sound system and not just like also like how well the people on stage can hear themselves because there's so much going on, like their ability to stay together with Omar's crazy playing that goes very off and then comes back Um but yeah, I've seen them. I've seen them really good as well. The last time I saw them, the sound was kind of messed up, uh, unfortunately. But then let's see. I've seen one of the bands that took me the longest to see was Radiohead. I finally saw them in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park, um, and that was not outside Lands, but rather um, 
Maybe it was outside. No, it was outside lands. Yes, it was. It was outside lands. Not Hardly Strictly. Hardly Strictly is the one that's free. I've been to many Hardly Strictly bluegrass shows. <clears throat> um, but yeah, the uh, I, I saw Radiohead in Golden Gate Park. That was awesome. Even though the power went out in the middle of one of their songs, it was like God was trying to kill the show. That was something else. Because I previously had tried to see Radiohead in Northern Virginia where I grew up, and it got rained out. It was a two-day Radiohead show. Both days got rained out. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I saw Exodus live once and their amp blew out and I thought I went deaf for a minute before I realized what happened. Oh, God. <laughs> I was like, oh, crap, I'm too close. I was like, I got You're like, I just stage. lost a whole happened. range of treble and mids. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but you, um, as for soft, I mean, yeah, like I do listen to a lot of hardest. I wouldn't say I really listen to much soft, but softer. Uh, things I've seen Menzingers live. I've seen Pup live. Uh, Menzingers are always great. I've seen. Oh, I've actually seen the Mountain Goats. <laughs> it's probably they're they're like folk punk. Uh, they do that no children song that appeared. And they do a lot of music that actually appeared in the Adult Swim show Moral Oral. If anyone remembers that, Mountain Goats are great. <laughs> Scotty May says his mom got pregnant with him after seeing Smashing Pumpkins in the '90s. That's sick, dude. <laughs> I know your parents. That's awesome. <laughs> I've not seen pumpkins actually. I I liked them, but would never enough to go and find them. I've seen one of the coolest shows I ever saw was um, in '97 at a small club that is no longer in existence in Washington D.C. And that was Incubus and System of a Down, and it was Incubus's science tour, and it was System mm -hmm. of a Down's first major tour ever, and. System of a Down was opening for Incubus, and you should never have System of a Down open for you. Those guys must have sound checked with their amps on four and then turned them up to 11 um, or maybe 12. Uh, my God, like System of a Down in a small club is not something you could ever see now. Uh, but that was a show I will never forget. I had never heard of System of a Down. I had no idea. These people came out. The singer looks like the Antichrist. He's six and a half feet tall or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the guitar player is like a little demon. He's painted up with silver makeup. And he's got <laughs> braids and he's like, eh, got this Ibanez Tallman and stuff or the Iceman, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, Sugar and was like, the first. <laughs> just, the first song yeah. I heard from them was Sugar. Like, the kombucha mushroom oh, Exactly. <laughs> That's, I was just like, what is this? As for smashing, smashing pumpkins, they're like they're one of those bands where it's like I like their music, but I do not like Billy Corgan as a person. Well, yeah, <laughs> let's not peek beneath the surface of too many of these fellows here, but yeah, yeah, that's a that's a separate the art from the artist thing right there. There is a line for me on that. Um, I've never mm -hmm. been a Marilyn Manson fan, but then once you find out about some of that stuff, uh, it's yeah, exactly, yeah, it's hard to. His, some of his he does make good music, but I I can't really. Um, I do love. I've definitely seen Nine Inch Nails. Um, I got I saw Nine Inch Nails in like 2005. I got free tickets from working at Guitar Center in San Francisco. I got to see them. I've seen definitely Pearl Jam. I've seen. Uh, yeah, I've seen Soundgarden. I've seen, I did not see Nirvana that, 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 you know, he died when I was pretty young. So I, mm -hmm. I missed that. <laughs> Jason, you're cute. Um, did Marilyn Manson do bad stuff? I thought he was nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did some bad stuff. He did. He did. <clears throat> anyway, anyway, let's not <laughs> go to that. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen now my dad's taken me to see I've seen Jethro Tull a few times I've seen um, Emerson Lake and Palmer in when I was that would have been the mid 90s when I was a teenager um, so I've seen some a few of the old guys there and who else have I seen that's impressive uh, oh well there's a couple of rap shows that I've seen that are unbelievable I saw obviously Wu-Tang with Rage and the thing I remember the most about that was that ODB was so drunk, he just was sitting in a chair drinking and not rapping at all. Like, he wasn't even doing his parts. Like, he was just on stage drinking as a mascot. Um, rest in peace, ODB. But it was Ghostface Killer in a small club that I will remember. Him and Capadonna, 
put on a show. They came on two hours after they were supposed to, and they were so lit. Like, they were so blinded. Like, Ghost could barely open his eyes. And then they put on the best show that you'd ever want to see. So that was something else. Um, I've seen, it was a night of Swedish death metal. It was up at the Hammerstein Ballroom up in New York City. Oh, I wow. saw At the at the Gates, Arch Enemy, and Amon Armarth. Weird. Three three Swedish bands that all start with the letter A, but saw them all in a row that one night. And then you know how like some bands, they'll do that wall of death? Amon Armarth, they have this thing where you do a rowboat where everyone drops to the floor and starts doing like, like because of the Viking longship, we all start rowing. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, let's see. I have seen animals as leaders in person. I've definitely seen Tool a million times, guys. You got to know that. I mean, Perfect Circle, I've seen a million times. I had a crazy romantic wrong. experience with a girl when I was like 20 at a Perfect Circle show. That was crazy. I'll never forget that. I've seen Pussifer a bunch of times, including recently. Um, let's yeah. see. Uh, I saw Jizza, the Jizza in a small club. That was incredible. Um, I've seen Qbert. If you guys know Qbert, the DJ is like a super pioneering, crazy scratch DJ. I saw him in a small club. That was only like a forty-minute show. That was mind blowing. Um, yeah. I've seen One thing, all kinds of DJs, obviously. Yeah, I'm ashamed that. Well, not ashamed. It's 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 beyond my control. But that I'll never get to experience CBGBs because it closed before my time. Closed when I was like too young to appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah, no, Carl Carson, I, I can't, I can't give all the details. It was just, it was, I was out of town. So it was one of those, you know, romances that you have over the course of a week. And like the concert was the tipping point, like the perfect circle music is just, yeah. If you take a date to a concert like that, it's over, you know, that's all I'll say about yeah. that. Just like the, like the guy who's like, Oh, I got, my mom got pregnant after the smashing pumpkins show. It's, same principle only yeah, no children me. were created thank thank the lord um It'll kelly johnson me. did have one ice and fire question that he threw in okay <laughs> and okay. he was asking if rob survived instead of john and had to fight the war of the dawn alongside danny how would that be different um the reason why rob is dead and john is not and the reason why danny was not born as a heiress of house targaryen but rather as a refugee and a slave is because george likes redeemed broken heroes and he's making a statement about privilege he's saying only someone that has a certain perspective can be capable of a certain kind of leadership perhaps or a certain kind of self-sacrifice rob is very confident and bold you might even say entitled even though he's noble kid trying to do his best He's like, <clears throat> they put a crown on his head. He's like, yeah. I mean, they could have stopped the war when Ned died, but they kept up with it. Like, there's, you can criticize Rob for sure. John is a different character. John is bold, but John also um, is has this outsider's perspective, and now he's gained the wildling perspective. Would would Rob have been able to do what John did north of the wall? Perhaps not. Different personality type. So. It's hard to say what Rob would have done, but we can say that George is creating a certain kind of hero with Danny and John. So that's what I would say. Cripples, bastards, and broken things, right? Mm -hmm. Second sons, cast offs, former slaves. The weak, sh the yeah. meek shall inherit the earth. You know, it's kind of like that. The humble shall. Yeah, that's why I like. As much as I like Rob Stark, but the narrative called for him to die because our our heroic characters that will live are going to be the ones that, in a society like this, are the ones that are not meant to have that power. Women, bastards. Well, John's case, bastard, but depends on how George approaches that. But, you know, dwarves, crip, uh, differently abled brand. Like, again, these are people that in, in a real medieval feudal society would have been cast to the wayside, but they are among our most important figures here. 
Rob being the true born son of a Lord, great character, but he doesn't fit the mold of the meek inheriting the earth. He is the status quo. I saw, um, Corn did a family values tour. They had Limp Biscuit on there and System of a Down and Ramstein. And Ramstein got shut down that. because the singer came out with a black rubber phallus mm -hmm. basically taped onto the front of a pair of tan underwear. So it, <laughs> it actually, no, it wasn't black. It was tan. So it looked like he was there naked, but with a very oversized member to you to like, uh, like Bonobo uh, or Bonobo, the, uh, the dwarf that Tyrion plays oh. and the, po the police in Virginia were not having it. He went like two yeah. songs and they shut them down. And then he came back on 10 minutes later in a different costume. So I, I have, I've seen Rammstein live and they have brought out the penis cannon to shoot white confetti into the crowd. That's they're very German. <laughs> Um, then, uh, at nine 30 club, I saw Les Claypool fearless flying frog brigade on their first ever tour when no one knew what they were going to do. And their entire set was pink Floyd animals cover to cover. Hmm. Now, Tim, this was in again, 97. Um, and I had never really heard pink Floyd much. And so my introduction to pink Floyd was Les Claypool playing it live in front of me. And then I went and listened to Animals and I was like, damn, he actually mostly played it note for note, except for a couple of jam outs. And uh, so that was incredible. And I've seen yeah. Frog Brigade a few times. Yes, the original 930 on H Street. I've been there at least 20 times. I've seen uh, just so many shows there. Like just- yeah. I've, never, I've never seen Pink Floyd, obviously, because Tickets to see Roger Waters are ungodly expensive, but I have seen Australian Pink Floyd come around. My me and my dad went to go see that. Uh, so City Slacker was at that show at nine thirty, that Frog Brigade show. That's very cool. I have seen um, David Gilmore on his tour a few years ago. Brought everybody but Roger Waters right before um, Nick Wright died. Mm. The key, that, Nick Wright. That's the keyboard player, right? No, Nick Mason and Rick Wright. I get those names flipped around. Nick Mason is the drummer. Rick Wright is the keyboard player, correct? I, I don't know. The keyboard player <laughs> that, died. My dad would know. My the dad keyboard know. player died a few years ago. And Roger Waters uh, and Pink Floyd, they never play together except for that one benefit concert. They played yeah. four songs together. That is it. <laughs> but I saw... Nick Mason on drums. Yeah, Rick is keys. So yeah, Rick died shortly after playing the couple tours with Gilmore when Gilmore made a solo album on an island. So that was, I basically got to see Pink Floyd without Roger Waters. And they played oh, okay. a lot of their hits. And it was in Oakland at the Paramount Theater. That was, that was something else. That was amazing. <laughs> I've never seen Waters though. Um, He's tours a lot. I've never seen him. Yeah. So anyway, that was fun. Concert time with uh, Dave and Tim. Yeah, it was a short stream, so we had time to fill. <laughs> short stream, the only two and a half cool. hours. It's kind of <laughs> kind of puny. <laughs> um, I've seen Buckethead. I've seen George Clinton. Um, oh, I saw Bootsy at the Independent in San Francisco, and Bootsy did something amazing. Bootsy came down into the crowd like Jesus. That's the only way I can put it, is he came down into the crowd and just laid hands on people. He's talking about the hands of funk, and he's just walking around like laying hands, and everyone's just like dancing, and the rest of the band's playing. I've never seen anything like that and this guy's in his 70s or maybe even 80 by now I mean, he's very old he's got another bass player he only plays like the lead parts you know and does the singing you know he's freaking old um but he's still doing his thing and like yeah he came out and laid the hands of funk on the crowd and it was like the funky jesus man if he touched you you had to dance twice as hard you know what i mean like <laughs> <laughs> that was something else. So yeah, God love Bootsy. And let's see. I saw Oysterhead 
I have not seen fish, but I saw oyster head. Mm. And I've seen Dead and Company. I've seen Phil Lesh at Phil Lesh's club in Marin, uh, which is called, of course, um, Terrapin Station after the band. Um, so that was that was Phil and Friends with some ridiculous musicians. I forget the names. I could think of it if I stopped and tried, but yeah that was a cool that was that was one of my best probably my best dead experience because one of my best friends of course is a official deadhead so yeah right on guys well there it is tim you got any got any one got any cappers no no one no one is good i think i've mentioned uh bouncing souls i say would be the last good one that i saw um my first concert ever, though, was Orgy and Sugar Ray. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Orgy on the Family Values Tour. I've not seen Sugar Ray. But in high school, I had a little bit of blonde streaks in my hair, and everybody thought I looked like Sugar Ray, and I never got that haircut again. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Uh, nothing against them. I just did. That's not what I was going for. So, <laughs> uh, let's see who else, who, what other, um, yeah, the first, the first two bands that I ever saw live do not reflect my current musical tastes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, yeah, they, they don't usually, um, what was the first, I don't know what the first show I ever saw was, but it might've been Jethro Tull. It might've been my dad taking me to Jethro Tull or something. I don't know. Anyway, that was fun. So, yeah. I've been watching you guys in the chat. Have fun, too, sharing your concerts. So, I look forward to yeah. some of those in the comments, I'm sure. <clears throat> oh, no, the point wasn't to declare anyone the winner. And I obviously win, also. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I... No, I'm just kidding. We're all winners when we go to see live music. That's the point. <laughs> I have seen some other people too at like Hardly Strictly whose names escape me. Um, I've seen like Ravi Shankar and, and Anura Shankar, his daughter. Um, I've seen whatever. We could always think of more, but I'm yeah. going to go ahead and get the birds out. They're screaming at me. So cheers guys. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you, like I said, with a video this week. And I might do an extra live stream this week, too. I don't know, because we got a lot of chapters I want to read and other stuff we got to do. So Anushka. Did I, what did I say? I said Adura or something. Yeah, Anushka. Anushka Shankar. That's right. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for joining me. Oh, you guys follow Great Ways, Tim. But yeah, this was fun, man. Appreciate it, dude. Yep. <laughs> We had to cleanse the the Roos and Ramsey Jane Poole vibes with some just some classic music music woodshedding there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Jane Poole. Okay, guys, have a good uh, Sunday. We'll talk to you later. Yep. Good night.